Welcome. I'm Dr. Vinay Prasad. I'm a hematologist oncologist, and I'm associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. In my professional life, I see patients, I teach trainees, and I do research in healthcare policy. This is Plenary Session. Plenary Session is a podcast at the intersection of medicine, oncology, and health policy, and you're listening to season three. On this week's episode, I'm joined by Margaret McCartney. She is a GP in the UK, and she is renowned for thoughtful columns on evidence-based medicine. And she's going to be talking about the pandemic and non-pharmacologic interventions to stop the spread of COVID-19. We didn't really do a lot of randomized control trials. Was that a smart strategy? And next, I'm joined by Jason Seltzer. Dr. Seltzer is at Cold Spring Harbor. He is a cancer biologist, and he's going to talk about some of the intricacies in cancer biology. He is one of the most thoughtful basic scientists out there in cancer biology, and I really think the world of him, and I think you're going to enjoy this discussion. But first, I'm going to have a bit of a podcast dialogue about some of what's in the week's news. So stay tuned. If you like this podcast and want more content, follow me on Twitter at vprasadmdmph. Check out the YouTube channel, Vinay Prasad, MD, MPH. Patreon backers will get access to the slides for lectures I give on Plenary Session. Want to hear from us? Email us your question at plenarysessionpodcast at gmail.com. So this week, the New England Journal came out guns blazing. They joined Scientific American, and they took a stand on an issue they don't normally take a stand on, which is the presidential election. But they didn't do it in the classic way. They didn't come straight out and say, we don't like Trump, we like Biden. They did it in a roundabout way. They have an editorial that's entitled, Dying in a Leadership Vacuum. And you know what? It's short enough that I think it's worth it to read it to you all. I also think it's worth it to read it to y'all because I don't think people are reading things. I don't think people are reading things that often. Um, like Tempress, which apparently is how you pronounce TMP, SSR2, or whatever that receptor was, that polymorphism. Um, I think that was a research letter that was labeled racist and not many people read it. And I don't think many people are reading this article because if you read it, you would be bored to death because it's, it's really not so strong. Let me read it to you. COVID-19 has created crisis throughout the world. This crisis has produced a test of leadership. With no good option to combat a novel pathogen, countries were forced to make hard choices about how to respond. Here in the United States, our leaders have failed that test. They've taken a crisis and turned it into a tragedy. The magnitude of this failure is astonishing. According to Johns Hopkins Center for Systems Science and Engineering, the U.S. leads the world in COVID cases and deaths due to the disease, far exceeding the number in larger countries such as China. The death rate in this country is more than double that of Canada exceeds that of Japan, a country with vulnerable and elderly population by a factor of almost 50, and even dwarfs the rate in lower middle-income countries such as Vietnam by a factor of 2,000. COVID-19 is an overwhelming challenge and many factors contribute to the severity, but the one we can control is how we behave, and in the United States, we have consistently behaved poorly. We know that we could have done better. China, when faced with the first outbreak, chose strict quarantine and isolation after an initial delay. Those measures were severe but essential, essentially eliminating transmission to the point where the outbreak began and reducing the death rate to reported three per million as compared to the more than 500 per million in the United States. Okay, I just have to make an aside. One, I mean, I don't know if we can trust that data from China, to be honest with you. Um, two, you know, it's an authoritarian government, so you can do things you can't do in a free society, okay? I mean, you know, it is what it is. Okay, go back to their thing. Countries that had far more exchange with China, such as Singapore and South Korea, began intensive testing early, along with aggressive contact tracing and appropriate isolation, and have had relatively small outbreaks. Okay, see, I like that more. And New Zealand had used the same measures together with its geographic advantages. It is an island. Uh, they didn't say that. I said that. Uh, to come close to eliminating the disease, something that has allowed the country to limit the time of closure and to largely reopen society to a pre-pandemic level. In general, not only have many democracies done better than the U.S., but they've also outperformed us by orders of magnitude. Okay, fair enough. I think that's true. Why has the U.S. handled this pandemic so badly? We have failed at almost every step. We had ample warning, but when the disease first arrived, we were incapable of testing effectively, and we couldn't provide even the most basic PPE to healthcare workers and the public. And we continue to be way behind the curve in testing. While the absolute numbers of tests have increased substantially, the more useful metric is the number of tests performed per infected person. And that puts us far below the international list, below such places such as Kazakhstan, Zimbabwe, and Ethiopia, countries that cannot boast the biomedical infrastructure and the manufacturing capacity that we have. More 
Moreover, a lack of emphasis on developing capacities meant the U.S. test results are often long delayed, rendering the results useless for disease control. That is for damn sure. You take so long to get back the test, it ain't so useful. Okay, going on. Although we tend to focus on technology, most of the interventions that have had large effects are not complicated. The U.S. instituted quarantine and isolation measures late and inconsistently, often without any effort to enforce them after the disease has spread substantially in many communities. Our rules on social distancing have in many places been lackluster, lackadaisical at best, not lackluster, lackadaisical at best, with loosening of restrictions long before adequate disease control had been achieved. And in much of the country, people simply don't wear masks, largely because our leaders have stated outright that masks are political tools rather than effective infectious control measures. The government has appropriately invested heavily in vaccines vaccine development, but its rhetoric has politicized the development process and led to growing public distrust. I have to pause and just make a note that it wasn't just, of course, the elected leaders that said that it was actually did occur in the pages of these journals. I'll read you a quote from May 21st, 2020, in the Journal of Medicine. Quote, we know that wearing a mask outside healthcare facilities offers little, if any, protection from infection, end quote. Okay, so, I mean, we can, we can blame them too. I mean, I think they are not setting a good example. I'll be the first to admit that. By them, I mean DJT. Uh, we're going to come back to DJT in a minute. Um, but the, this article, you know, it, it puts it all squarely uh, at, at the doorstep of that. Going on, next paragraph. The United States came into the crisis with enormous advantages, along with tremendous manufacturing capacity. We have a biomedical research system that is the envy of the world. We have enormous expertise in public health, health policy, and basic biology, and have consistently been able to turn that expertise into new therapies and preventive measures. And much of that national expertise resides in governmental institutions, yet our leaders have largely chosen to ignore and even denigrate experts. That's true. We're also incredibly politically divided in this moment. That's a problem. Okay, well, this is longer than I thought. The response of our nation's leaders have been consistently inadequate. The federal government has largely abandoned disease control to the states. Governors have varied in the responses, not so much by party as by competence. But whatever the competence, governors do not have the tools that Washington controls. Instead of using those tools, the federal government has undermined them. The CDC, which is the world's leading disease response organization, has been eviscerated and suffered dramatic testing and policy failures. The NIH has played a key role in vaccine development, but has been excluded from much of crucial government decision making. And the FDA has been shamefully politicized, appearing to respond to pressure from administration rather than scientific evidence. Our current leaders have under cut trust in science and in government, causing damage that will certainly outlast them. Instead of relying on expertise, the administration has turned to uninformed opinion leaders and charlatans who obscure the truth and facilitate the promulgation of outright lies. Let us be clear about the cost of not even taking simple measures. An outbreak that has disproportionately affected communities of color has exacerbated the tensions associated with inequality. Many of our children are missing school at critical times in their social and intellectual development. The hard work of healthcare professionals who have put their lives on the line has not been used wisely. Our current leadership takes pride in the economy, but while most of the world has opened up to some extent, the U.S still suffers from disease rates that prevented many businesses from reopening, with the resultant loss of hundreds of billions of dollars and millions of jobs. More than 200,000 Americans have died, and some deaths from COVID were unavoidable. But although it is impossible to project the precise number of additional American lives lost because of weak and inappropriate government policies, it is at least in the tens of thousands in a pandemic that has already killed more Americans than any conflict since World War II. Anyone else who has recklessly squandered lives and money in this way would be suffering legal consequences. Our leaders have largely claimed immunity for their actions, but this election gives us the power to render judgment. Reasonable people will certainly disagree about the many political positions taken by the candidates, but the truth is neither liberal nor conservative. When it comes to response to the largest public health care crisis of our time, our current political leaders have demonstrated they are dangerously incompetent. We should not abet them and enable the death of thousands of more Americans by allowing them to keep their jobs. That's it. It's a powerful article, but... It's weak in a couple of ways. One, it doesn't have the courage to name Redfield, Bricks, Donald J. Trump. It doesn't actually use their names. And, you know, potentially there are some governors, potentially the governor of, Mich of Michigan, of Rhode Island, who did do a good job. Even Cuomo, who, though he had some initial missteps, has tried his best, I think. Even de Blasio, I think, who's tried his best at some points, but he, he bungled some stuff early. I mean, I think some of these politicians are mixed. This is really an article about DJT. Let's be honest. It's about Donald J. Trump. And in fact, on Twitter, that's what people said. How courageous of the New England Journal to talk about Donald J. Trump like this, to, to subtweet him like this. And I think it's interesting. Is it virtuous? Is it courageous? That's a, it's a question I want to I wanna talk it over with you. Um, is, is, this, is this the right thing to do, this kind of, this kind of commentary? Um, so one, I think this is called dying in the leadership vacuum. I think it's about Donald J. Trump. If anyone thinks otherwise, stop listening to this podcast right now because I will question your sanity or decision making. Um, it's clearly about Donald J. Trump. It's a subtweet. But they don't have the guts to say his name. I think that's telling. They don't have the guts to say his name. So it's kind of a weak half half measure, half condemnation. Somebody said, you know, imagine you were at a time where something really bad was happening. Shouldn't you speak out against it? And I was like, yeah, but you should also call it by its name. You should say that that's the person who's fucked it up. It's Donald J. Trump. 
Okay. So, and has he screwed it up? <laughs> yeah, of course. I think he has. I think he has. I think they're right. In many cases, the early, if you had gotten hold of it early, that was the chance. Contact tracing, that was when it has a role early. Um, you know, by the time mid-March creeped around, it was already bungled. I mean, it was, it was, a lar- it was largely bungled. It still could have gotten better. Still could have done better in a lot of states. But um, yeah, there's a lot of problems. And it, a lot of it was early. I think they're right about that. So I, I don't disagree with their, with their stance. But let's talk about writing it. Was it the right thing to do? So I had a quick series of polls. And let me see. Oh, wow. We already got 1,000 votes in just uh, five hours. Quick series of polls about the current NE jam dying in a leadership vacuum. Curious what you think. Number one, writing it. Was it the right thing to do? 71% say yes. And 28% say no. It wasn't the right thing to do. Number two, did the article have the courage to name Donald J. Trump at any point? Or did it refer to leaders without name? And the answer is 93% are right. It did not name people who were actually screwing things up. And 7% are wrong. They say it had the courage to name. It didn't have the courage to name. It just said agencies very broadly, but it didn't say Redfield, didn't say Trump. And Redfield's not on the ballot, to be honest with you. He can't do anything about that. Trump is on the ballot. That's the guy who bungled this. That's who they're talking about. Number three, will this, will this commentary change votes in this election, i.e. help Biden win? Only 14% of the voting, the 600 people who voted, the 700 people who voted, have said it will help Biden win. But overwhelmingly, 85% say it won't help Biden win. And that's my intuition too. I think you know, he's he he's polling very well and most of the simulations on 538, he's going to win. But then again, we've been there before with Hillary. But then again, it was more volatile back then. Now it's less volatile. So I think he's he, the odds are in his favor. But will this change anyone's mind? Nah, I don't think so. Number four, will it change votes in a future election? Not this election, but will it make people more receptive to science and medicine? Will it make it more appealing to the rural working class voters who may be reluctant to accept science and maybe saying things like, well, climate change is a hoax and vaccines cause autism and, you know, those kind of anti-science messages. Will it change their minds? And 21% say it will change their minds, but 78%, 79% actually say, no, it will alienate them. That's what I think. I think it's going to alienate them. I'll come back to that. Number five, will this commentary have any positive impact in the world besides making the writers feel good? 40% say yes, it'll have some positive impact, but 60% say no, nothing, nothing positive, besides making us feel good that we took a stand. And number six, I ask again, using a utilitarian view of the world, is it the right thing to do? And they're right in a utilitarian world means right things to do are the things that bring more good in the world. And already the answers to these questions have conceded that this is unlikely to change votes for Biden. It's unlikely to change future votes in a more pro-science direction. It's likely to alienate rural white voters. It's likely to make the New England Journal and and everything it stands for, medicine, be thought of as a liberal enclave, which is a worry that risks driving away people. So when one puts it together, I think that the answers to the question suggest, and in fact, will it have any positive impact besides making the writers feel good? Most people, 60% say no, it won't. So I think the answer suggests that it'll have no positive impact, in fact, a net negative impact. So is it the right thing to do by utilitarian view of the world? And the answer is 60% say yes, it's the right thing to do, and 40% say no. And that is called an improvement from the baseline poll of 70-20, uh, 70-30, uh, 60-40, but it's called cognitive dissonance. It's called cognitive dissonance. You know, there are, of course, two frameworks of how we think about things. There's deontologic ethics, things that are right in and of themselves, and there's utilitarian ethics, which are things that are right or virtuous or things that bring about the greatest good for the for, for, for the greatest number. Or you can even have some sort of modifications of that. You can prioritize good for people in your immediate social circle and then, you know, have lesser good for others. But there are other utilitarians who will argue that it should be just a strict greatest good for the greatest number. We shouldn't take those kinds of prioritizations. And that's that's all fair, fair and well. But I think here we're conceding that, you know, most people taking this poll believe that it's going to have no net positive benefit. And yet they still believe it's the right thing to do, which means they must be clinging to some sort of deontologic view of ethics that the right things to do are just right, whether or not they help or not help. I think it's really interesting. Um, I'm going to disagree. So, you know, I think on a number of issues, my view is that the right and virtuous action are actions that accomplish net good. If you're doing something that doesn't accomplish net good, it's not right. In this case, I'll go further. If you believe that they ought to take a stand against this president for bungling this and leading to certainly an excess of deaths, which is something that even I believe, yes, I believe that to be true, um, then they're not really courageous about it. They don't have the guts to name him. They don't have the guts to say it. In fact, some would say it lacks courage. 
It's a mealy mouth editorial. Very mealy. That's what it is. It doesn't have the courage to do that. Two, but it does give people the message that they are on the liberal side of things. It's not that they, they don't go all the way and say it, but they strongly hint we got to vote this guy out. So it does politicize them to some degree. And let's be honest, they're not, a, they're not a journal that's ever been in this space. Lancet, they're opposite. They're always out there. Kashmir, they got an opinion. Yemen, they got an opinion. And you know what? I, uh, I'll be honest with you. I agree with most of their opinions. I'm not faulting them for having these opinions, but I'm just pointing out they're consistent. Um, Yemen, they have an opinion. Uh, crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa, they have an opinion. Um, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, they had an opinion. They had a big opinion. They had the courage to name it. They named those wars. They said those wars were human rights violations. Those wars led to death. They did not fight terrorism. They said it all on their pages. They had some courage. You know, I got to hats off to Richard Horton, actually. You know, you, you can you can't I mean, you can debate whether or not he ought to have done that. But when you decide you ought to do it, at least he went all in. He pushed all the chips in. New England Journal, they decide they ought to do it. They don't even push their chips in. They don't have the guts to say this guy's name. So I think by a deontologic view of the world, it, it's, it's half hearted. It's weak. Um, I think it does put a big political flag on them. And I think that political flag has some serious downsides to it. I think there's some serious downsides. I think, um, you know, I'm somebody who grew up in the Midwest. I went to high school in LaPorte, Indiana. You can look it up on a map. Uh, There's not a lot of people in that town. And it is a, I would imagine, I haven't been by in a while, but it's probably Trump-Pence country. And the thing about Trump-Pence country is people in Trump-Pence country, they don't like a lot of things. And they don't like when people come around and act like they know better than you and act like they're a lot smarter than you. And, you know, when they say things like, in much of the country, people simply don't wear masks largely because our leaders have stated outright that masks are political tools. When they say something like that, people in the middle of the country, in flyover country, where I grew up, they might say something like, you're kind of pushing it a little bit, aren't you? In your own journal, did you not say... Did you not print that masks have no benefit to the public? Did Tony Fauci not come on 60 Minutes and talk at length about how masks have no benefit because people will have compensatory mechanism to touch their face? Did he not say that? And then when you change it 180, you go from masks definitely don't work to there is no equipoise to support a trial of masks, which is where we are now. You did that 180. And then you tell us we're stupid for remembering what you said before. And then you say that the reason we're not wearing it is, of course, because because DJT doesn't wear it. I think it's bad that DJT doesn't wear it. It's a missed opportunity. In an editorial I wrote this week, I said, you know, it's a missed opportunity for him not to enroll in a randomized trial of Regeneron. It's a missed opportunity for him not to wear a mask. He could have modeled behavior. You want that from leaders. So I do think it's a missed opportunity. However, I wouldn't put the blame squarely on his doorstep when, in fact, they themselves should have some blame on their doorstep. And so somebody in some of these states may look at them as an elitist medical organization that is not even being honest that they said something different not that long ago. And that's going to turn people off. The other thing is that they don't need to weigh in on its election. All the simulations show that people have decided. In fact, the poll I carried says that it's not going to change anyone's mind. They don't need to weigh in. I think, you know, it's like betting on a horse as it's approaching the finish line in the lead. I mean, they don't need to weigh in. Um, so I think it's not, it may make a lot of people feel good, but it doesn't really accomplish any value. Um, the, the, the crisis will be, how do you get people in those states to take science seriously, to allow themselves to think about evolutionary theory in their classrooms, to allow themselves to be acquainted with science for climate, to allow themselves to reconsider their positions on vaccines, to believe that scientists are not uh, sleeper agents for the left, but actually do approach things with some objectivity. Um, that just because Trump says open school, scientists aren't going to say don't open schools just to thwart Trump. So to build their trust again, I think we have to, it's going to take a lot of work. And, and these kind of editorials, I don't think serve that purpose. In fact, I think they, they deepen mistrust. They also, I don't think, change the election. They have no net positive contribution in the world. I think it's a net negative. And I think that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of people who've taken the survey. Then the cognitive dissonance, of course, is, is it a virtuous thing to do? Now, I guess my belief is that you can do all sorts of things in life, but if they do not actually fulfill your purpose and your goals, you can't say they're virtuous. You might like to do it. it might make you feel good, but they cannot be virtuous. Virtuous things are things that make the world better for other people. If this is the issue you care about, I think there are a lot of related things that they can do to make it better. The individuals who comprise the editorial board can 
go out there and do everything they can to influence the vote in swing states. There are a lot of people who are doing that. They can cast their vote. They can donate to political candidates they believe are going to do the right thing. But this kind of editorial, I don't think, is going to help anybody. And I think it, it's, and oh, as I talked about the Lancet, but I didn't talk about the New England Journal. They've never, I mean, they, I don't think they've ever commented at this level on a, on a political election. They're, they're really defying what their usual convention is. Same with Scientific America. You know, they're proud to say we've never commented in 200 years. Um, that's not always a good thing. Uh, this is, I think, part of a broader uh, space in biomedicine where it's easy to virtue signal. It's easy to say masks are good and anyone who doesn't wear them is a moron. It's easy to say this guy bungled the election and we don't like him. Uh, it's a lot harder to think about what are the steps, what are the ways to actually move people's opinion. Now, I don't know. I don't pretend to have all the answers. However, I believe that a key issue is, this, is the opening public schools. That's an issue that I think is very important. Um, and it's an issue that I spent a lot of time reading about um, before I decided to do a few episodes on it. Um, and, and, and every way I look at it, I just think that it is a great blunder, colossal blunder. We heard in episode 15, 315, that, um, you know, the data that this actually fuels viral spread is deeply limited. We heard in episode 313 that the data that harms kids is, is a lot. And then there's a lot more data that I haven't presented yet because the people who I've emailed, they're not replying to plenary sessions emails, which is another topic I'm going to come to, which is you people who keep suggesting names to me. Um, they're not replying to plenary sessions emails, which I don't blame them, of course. Why do they want to come on plenary session? Um, so, so I'm trying to get some more people who've done some really important work, especially about if online education uh, recapitulates in person. And the answer is, long story short, it ain't so, it ain't so hot. Um, so, so what's my point here? I think, um, I think medicine is to some degree political. It will always be political because questions of public health are uh are value judgments to some degree and and, and policy and politics is, is science plus value but i do think to, to 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 a larger degree that science is something that can be impartial that can say that trump is wrong about i don't know 1000 things but he happens to be right about the kids the the elementary school education he's probably on the right side of that um i think i think science also allows us to say that um that somebody like John Ioannidis is actually much more complex than he has been portrayed in Twitter. Um, and that his views are actually not, he's not a sleeper agent of the right. His views are much more nuanced. His views are much more consistent with his prior views than people gave him credit for. It's not a departure. And they do go against what a lot of people think. But to be fair, of all those people who think that way, there are some of them who are doing the thinking, and there's a lot of them who are marching lockstep. And I think John is somebody who's unlikely to march lockstep with anyone ever. He's always going to try to be independent in his assessment, whether or not you agree with him or not. You can disagree with him, but I think you got to respect the fact that he is not just saying this for some other purpose. He really does believe what he believes. And I think it's a mistake to throw everything he says away, even if you disagree with some of the central themes that he may be um, pointing out to some things that are very important. Um, and I think he is pointing out some things that are very important. I think that's what we tried to talk about. Um, so I think the schools is an issue that I think to come back to, that's an issue where it's ripe for change. You got a lot of people on the right who want schools open. You got a lot of people who are progressives who do see the value. You got a lot of people who are ID doctors, who are silent, who are scared of mob Twitter, um, who are reticent, who agree that it ought to open, that the data that supports closure is wrong, that closure is the intervention and not opening. And that's why I think that's the place that I have spent my efforts because I, I'm, I'm thinking as a tactician uh, that the goal of me doing this podcast is not for me to virtue signal. Uh, that's not my goal. And in fact, if that were my goal, I wouldn't have taken some issues that um, are on the political left where I find myself um, and, and, and smash them to bits. Uh, like, um, you know, whether or not that paper that's not racist is racist or those kinds of things. I mean, I think the, the, the goal is to try to persuade people to think more uh, clearly about these topics. And, and on this issue of schools, I think you can flip a lot of votes. Votes are ripe to be flipped. Uh, it's the first time in my life that I've seen Democrats strongly opposed to public schools um, and, and, and really putting out a regressive policy that they don't even see as regressive. It's, it's a ripe opportunity. This whether or not, you know, uh, dying in a leadership vacuum. This article it, it, it lacks the courage to to say who's the problem. It it it's certainly not going to change any votes. Uh, unlike I think I hope my podcasts have changed some minds, and I have gotten some emails suggesting they might have. Um, I think it's largely signaling, and uh, signaling makes people feel good. And in fact, maybe forty percent of med Twitter is signaling, but it's not a useful activity. 
It has no valid use in my mind. Um, similarly, on this podcast uh, in season two, I spent some time talking about why I um, think that a lot of the criticism of um, pseudoscience is a waste of time because people find these tweets that no one was reading and then they they quote tweet it and dunk on it. You can go back and listen. I give specific examples of what they're tweeting. A tweet that had like, you know, nobody liked it, one like, 10 likes, and then they quote tweet it just to say, look at this moron. Um, that those don't help anybody. They don't actually change anyone's mind who's an adherent to pseudoscience. And actually, maybe pseudoscience is not, not, the, not the pressing place to, to win the war of science denial. Um, maybe there's some other pressing places. Um, and, and I gave us a, a framework for how do you pick what, what pseudoscience or what science to debunk, and it should be you know invasive, harmful, costly, large budgetary impact, um, serious sequela, and the ability to flip minds was one of my value of information theories. You can go back and listen to that. And I think the same is true here. How do you pick what to editorialize? This editorial shouldn't have been dying in a leadership vacuum. It should have been um, closing public schools for children younger than 16 is something that is killing these kids and their future and is not helping us in our viral combat. And we, there are other things we should do first. That would have been a better editorial because that's where you can flip some votes. This, I think the votes are cast. In fact, many have literally been cast. Um, and they are just kind of betting on a, what they think is a winning horse. And, um, you know, every time there's a Supreme Court nominee that looks like they're a sure thing, there's always some lawyer that comes out of the woodwork that writes uh, an op-ed saying that even though I'm on the other side of the spectrum, I agree this person should be on the Supreme Court. And people who are in the field say that that's kind of a shameless way to just, you know, gain the favor of someone who's destined to be on the court anyway. Similarly, this is kind of, I think, in the same vein. So, you know, there have been a few people who are critical of this for different things. I think... Um, one of the criticisms is that science should stay out of politics. I'm not sure that I would articulate it that way. I mean, I don't think science or journals have to stay out of politics. I just certainly think that if if we'll agree that something has no net positive impact, they shouldn't do that. That's a stupid thing to do. And, and, and I believe that's my intuition. I don't know that to be true, but I think it's the intuition of a lot of people. And it's been conceded by people who still believe it's a valuable thing to do. Um, so, so that's one thing. And I would say, though, that... That I think maybe the way I would articulate it is that that the New England Journal may not have their finger on the pulse of medicine and on people. That's that's how I would articulate it. That even though Med Twitter is, is Bernie Warren Sanders esque, and that's the Twitter dialogue. And to be honest, that's where I kind of am very close to that in my in my in my political beliefs, uh, especially actually probably closer to Elizabeth. Um, when you read the comments, somebody told me this, read the comments on Medscape and MedPage. Read the comments on those websites. That's not Twitter. Those are just doctors who are getting a newsletter and they're commenting on articles. And that isn't left. That is quite center and often quite right. We can't forget there are a lot of doctors who are not of our political party and they may like this president for other reasons. Lord knows what they are, but they may. Um, and if you're going to do something that's just going to kind of divide and, and, and put a flag and say I'm on this sort of political side and not actually accomplish any good um, and alienate people and push them away from science, um, then I'm not sure it's a virtuous thing to do rather than just virtue signaling and, and further deepening trenches and, and, and tribalism in science. So those are just some scattered thoughts on dying in a leadership vacuum, which... Um, didn't have the courage to name names. Didn't have the courage to name names. And someday I'll tell you another story about naming names. Um, and, and that how instead it probably should have been about schools because that's the place that we can actually flip some votes. And, and we still have an opportunity to save this, save this year from a complete debacle. Um, oh, and then the related theme, bringing guests on. Yeah, I often get asked um, to bring guests on. And we are trying to bring guests on. A lot of people say no. And you may be shocked as a listener of this podcast why they would say no. I'll tell you why they're saying no. This is not a big enough platform for them. That's, a, that's that simple. Really, a lot of people view this as a trivial platform. There's so many podcasts. I think when I started, there were 800,000 podcasts. They're probably well over a million and a half now. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it's doubled since when I started. Why, why, are people, why do you think people are going to want to come on this podcast? You like it. You like it. But they don't like it. They don't even know what the hell it is. They've never listened. Oftentimes people come to the podcast and never listen to other episodes. They don't know what I have. It's, 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 it's not so easy. And also, you people who keep telling me who to bring on my podcast, I have other jobs, man. I got other things to do. I'm doing a lot of other things. This is like not my priority in life. I have a million, million other things to do. And I, I have to keep up on those things too. And I don't have time to chase after people who don't want to come on this podcast. If people don't want to come on this podcast, you know, 
That's their business. If I send them an email or a note and then they give me something that's like lukewarm, I, I don't got time to follow up on that. Okay, I don't got time for that. Uh, if they want to come, they want to come. A lot of people email me they want to come. So, you know, some people who are critical of who I'm having, you should know that there are people who want to come on and, um, and, 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 and largely I'm choosing people for, um, who have some strong opinion, uh, or, or have some well-justified evidence-based opinion. Uh, it doesn't have to be my opinion. And then the other thing is, yeah, why don't I bring on more people who disagree with me? I don't think a lot of people want to be debated on some podcast that's not going to pay them any money and has sort of a middling following, I, I just don't think that the, it's really appealing to them. There have been a lot of people who I've tried over the years and they, they don't even say no. They, that's the other thing you, you people don't understand. They don't say no. They, they f*** with me. And here's how they do it. They say they'll do it and then they go through scheduling and then we schedule them and then they cancel and then they push it out and then they cancel again. And so I'm blocking out my calendar all this time. I got somebody helping me schedule and she's got other things to do too. And we're all, and we're trying to get this to go. And then people don't really want to do it when the people don't really want to do something. You know, I can't, I can't give them eight hours of my time that I block out over the course of two months to have them keep dropping. Or, or one person who said, I'm definitely going to do it. And then, you know, their assistant wrote back that they'd be happy to reconsider uh, in 2021. This was like 29. This was a couple of years ago that they said 2021 will be their first availability. Okay, there are people who are just screwing with us and our time. So, you know, and again, it's not my full time job. This is like people ask, how much time does it take you to make the podcast? You know, the air, the, the amount of time the podcast runs add like 15 minutes. That's all the time I'm putting in. I'm not putting in a lot more time than that. Run for three hours. It took me three hours and 15 minutes with all my screw ups. Um, it's extemporaneous speaking. There's no, there's no scripting. There's no dialogue. There's, no, there's nothing. There's no preparation. It's an extemporaneous speaking based on what I'm thinking at the moment and what I've been thinking about. Uh, I don't have time to make it any more than that. Already at this time, it's too much time. So those are the fundamental challenges to, to, to getting all the guests that you want me to get, which I wish I could. I wish I could get the A level guests, perhaps someday, perhaps if this is a real radio show. It's not. It is a podcast for people interested in this in this space. Next up, we have Margaret McCartney, and she's going to talk about whether or not we could have and should have done more randomized control trials for non-pharmacological interventions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Why or why not? Stay tuned for that. And then I've got Jason Zelser. You won't want to miss this. Jason is one of the most thoughtful scientists in cancer medicine. I follow his papers religiously. And you should too, because he's doing good work. He's an early career scientist who's really looking at things in a clever way. So stay tuned. I'm back in plenary session, joined via Zoom by Dr. Margaret McCartney. Dr. McCartney is a general practitioner in Glasgow, Scotland. She is an expert in evidence-based medicine. She was a longtime columnist for the British Medical Journal with a wonderful column that I used to look forward to uh, with, with great fervor. Um, and now she's taken her talents to radio and is doing broadcasting in England on evidence-based medicine. Throughout the coronavirus crisis, I think Dr. McCartney has been a very sensible and reasonable voice um, talking about issues that we're easy to kind of push aside in the heat of the moment. And so we're going to talk about some of those today. Um, Dr. McCartney, it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure for, to be speaking to you. It's lovely to see you. And um, I have the joy of not just speaking to you on, on the podcast, but I can see you as well. So yes, you really can see me. And I've just woken up and I'm very disheveled. <laughs> looking good, Vinny, looking good. <laughs> we had a, a bit of confusion on, on, on AM, PM, UK time, US time. And, and here we find ourselves bright and early. But that's okay, because to talk to Dr. McCartney, is, it's a pleasure I'll take any time of day. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we should just jump right in. And I think what of one of the things that you've written recently, which I thought was just so well done, and not just me, I think many people on Twitter, um, in the broader community thought was well done, which is you were taking a look at non pharmacological interventions used in COVID-19. And one of your observations was, we have so many trials. Unfortunately, they're almost all pharmacologic intervention trials, we have randomized trials there. We also, surprisingly, don't have a lot of evidence of what to do in pandemics. Um, it, it's not exactly the most robust uh, section of the evidence-based medicine book. And so you came in and you said, for these interventions, these non-pharmacological interventions that have become nearly political, that we have tribes that we feel strongly about, 
Are there ways we can test it? And I wonder if you might kind of take us through your thinking on this issue. Yeah, so, um, and it's great that there has been so many high quality randomized controlled trials around COVID, plenty of absolutely appalling trials um, <laughs> and papers published, but, but some really fantastic stuff. And I think it's notable that a lot of these um, trials were planned, you know, so people had had the time to the time out after the, the last um, pandemic or the, the last um, major communicable disease and thought, okay, how are we going to do this better in the future? And people had made really good plans for that, which is fantastic. <laughs> but the same planning hadn't gone into non-drug interventions I and i think the problem we have is that um you know drugs for covid you're only going to be getting them if you're very severely ill realistically where no one's testing any preventative i think apart from hydroxychloroquine there might be something still going on there but but in the main um the drugs that you get are going to be when you're in hospital when you're really sure. sick Yet, we're putting million, lots and lots of different um, non-drug interventions into practice that are affecting millions of people, and yet we're not testing them. And I can really see us um, bumbling along through this pandemic just now and not coming to any great conclusions about what we should and shouldn't be doing in terms of our non-drug, our behavioural, social type interventions that we're doing to, as I say, millions of people. And we don't know whether they're doing any good, and they might well be doing harm. And I, I don't think we're being honest enough about that. I think we have to state our uncertainties and then try and reduce them. And there have been lots of polarised arguments and yeah. polarised disagreements, which is a real tragedy because I think that most people looking at the evidence, you know, for example, about masks, about school reopenings would say, well, actually, we don't know because we don't have the evidence. What should we do? We should generate that evidence. And I really um, find myself most distressed by the fact that so few trials are being planned that there's a great collaboration that started called BESI, mm -hmm. um, which is, and I forgive me when I'll need to look up what it stands for because behavioral and social environmental type interventions and that's great but they've only identified eight trials eight trials mm. in the world of non-drug interventions wow. when there's well over 1200 for drug interventions and that's just awful it's not sustainable when you know we're not going to we're not going to get anywhere if we're just going around in circles assuming that what we know that what we know is best but actually we don't and we're not being honest enough about that Margaret, one of the things proponents would say is that some of these non-pharmacological interventions, they just make perfect sense that they would work. I mean, wouldn't it be better to catch my droplets before I expel it all over you? And if I look at sort of a video of me excelling, expressing droplets in a, in a, I don't know, some sort of video machine that can capture that, it certainly does look better when I cover my face. So, um, you know, what makes you go that extra step and say that just because you have that kind of plausibility, you don't have that sort of evidence that you, you may need. Yeah, I, I, and I can understand that. You know, I can see that. You know, we all want to think of ourselves as sensible beings. We all want to take account of all the research that's been done in an area. And certainly these kind of studies are really important. You know, they are plausibility studies. That's, you know, that's helpful. That can help you decide what to do. But what we really want to know is, um, does making a country's policy of wearing masks in particular settings reduce the harm from COVID-19? And until you've answered that question, you just don't know. You can think of all kinds of things that might happen. You know, and um, people get in touch to say things like, well, you know, I've but since since mask wearing came in, the supermarket's not restricting the amount of people going in anymore. Yes. Um, it's just free for all, people are coming quite close to you. And um, you know, is that happening? Is that just an anecdote? I don't know. The way to find out should be to go and test that hypothesis and see whether or not it's true. But again, what you really want to know is is that associated with less harm from COVID nineteen? That's the outcome that really matters. Anything else is really a proxy. And you know, medicine has a long, long and and horrible history of thinking it's really great and doing really sensible things and has turned out not only to be wasting money but also to be giving false promises and actually doing harm very often in the process and you know we, we have lots of examples of these you know um you know starting with dr spock you know who wrote this multi-million pound selling yeah. book telling parents you know put your baby to sleep on the front because if they're sick they won't choke on it you know he had good intentions he didn't think he was doing anyone any harm he was trying to help and yet we know that thousands of yeah. baby were, were killed because um we now know that the evidence says that it's back to sleep put your baby to sleep on their back and they're less likely to suffer from sudden infant deaths so you, you know I, I think we until we have the humility to 
accept that our good intentions are not enough. We're going to keep going around in circles and we'll keep making avoidable errors, giving people you know, inadequate information, wasting money, wasting morale, wasting resources and not helping us do better here because we're having, we're going to have to live with COVID. I don't see yeah. a vaccine that's going to come in, in, you know, before the end of the year, as lots of people had said, you know, we, we have to find out how to live with this and allow it to do as little damage to the population as possible. I hear sirens in the background. I think they're coming for you, Dr. McCartney, for your heretical thinking on this <laughs> on this topic. But, um, you know, I, I, I very much agree with you. And I think that um, one of the challenges we saw with with masks was very quickly some very prominent people turned an issue that was really about uncertainty and evidence into sort of an advocacy issue and they became advocates. And it's fine to, I think, wear both hats at times, the evidence hat, the advocate hat. But sometimes if we confuse which hat we're wearing, if we're wearing our advocacy hat, we forget that there are a lot of uncertainties and downs and potential downsides. Um, one of the ways I thought that played out was this bizarre sort of inversion of evidence where, you know, I think many of us who looked at the evidence, especially those of us who are clinicians and know, you know, what that sort of gold standard evidence is. I think there are some people who look at it and their experiences in um, bio chemical um, properties or aerosolization and those sorts of things, those sort of environmental services fields. And they thought it was sort of robust evidence. But of course, the clinical evidence is if a government institutes a policy saying we're going to mandate masks, and that part of that policy includes how are you going to police it if they don't do it and how are you going to enforce it and what are the penalties and what are the rewards, all that's built into it. Um, does that intervention work in a large population? And that's really could be done as a cluster randomized trial. Um, one of the reasons why people tossed out at the outset it might not work is sort of compensatory behaviors, touching your face, adjusting your mask, as you allude to, even changing the rules around grocery store entry or, or going out more when you otherwise might not go out. And, and some of those specific things are considered sort of risk compensatory things, um, uh, sort of a longstanding literature on risk compensation or Peltzman effect. Um, and some people went in and said, well, one of those or two of those things are not true. Ergo, this must work. Um, you, so so the, the sort of the funny bit of logic is we haven't proven it works. Um, you've tossed out reasons why it might not work. We've disproven a couple of those reasons. Ergo, it should work. Um, you were never satisfied with this kind of this kind of explanation. I wonder if you might talk about that, that that you haven't ruled out compensatory things because you haven't looked at all the things and you can't even think of all the things. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. You can never think of all the things. You know, until you actually do a trial looking for the outcome that's the important outcome, you can never say you've looked at all the things. So I have permission to share this this, um, this story of a, of a woman who was raped um, over a decade ago. And when she was raped, the rapist put his hand over her mouth and she panics if something is over her mouth. And so she's hardly been out since the mandate to wear masks in shopping centres and on transport. Um, some people have said, well, you can wear a badge, badge you can bring a little um, thing from the government to say I, I am exempt. I don't want to go around, she says, um, you know, basically advertising that this awful thing has happened to me. Now, I'm not saying that that means that, you know, if you've got an evidence-based policy, you should not do it, but you have to understand what you're doing. You have to understand who's who's at risk by having this policy, and you have to think of ways to mitigate that. And if you think that all you're doing is a good thing, you're never going to question your policy enough and ask, what are the unintended consequences? What are the harms? Because we don't know what those harms are because we haven't been, been to find out we haven't we haven't admitted our uncertainty enough and therefore we're not going to look for stuff that we didn't know was there to start off with and and as i say the most important thing here is whether or not this policy reduces covid in the population and we don't know and the other problem that happens is that people kind of attach on to you so you find that there's um, a kind of group of very right-wing libertarians yeah that was a problem you know, they kind of attached on to that and then um, and then kind of use what you're saying or extrapolate what you're saying to stuff that you didn't actually say to start with which means that the whole debate becomes far more unpleasant and more, um, you know, and just more polarised. There should be some kind of ability to meet in the middle and for people to say, okay, this is where the evidence stops and this is the fuzzy edge of where my opinion begins. And it's fine to have opinions. I have many, many opinions. But I hope that what I try and do is to say, okay, this is the evidence and therefore this is what I make of it. This is what I think. Rather than people saying this is the evidence and my opinion and you can't tell what it is because they're saying it is all the science. And that's just not fair to the evidence. It's not fair to policymakers. It's not fair to the public. And, it, and it's not fair because at the end of the day, we won't find out any better information to help us get through this pandemic yeah. better than we currently are. 
In April, do you think, let's just take the United States. So we're a nation. Well, we, we've had some issues. <laughs> yeah. We've had some issues. But one can imagine a large area of territory with a lot of people in it um, that's perhaps less dysfunctional. Um, that area could do cluster randomized studies. I mean, it could divide itself into 200 you know, quadrants or counties or municipalities or things like that. And then say, you know, in some of the, and, and then have four things that we're going to test. One, um, the, the mandate universality of making a homemade cloth mask. Um, two, uh, 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 partitions with um, a lot of plexiglass partitions here, there, everywhere, um, even at schools on the desks of kids. Um, a face shields, wearing a face shield that we're going to give out. Um, maybe even the availability of hand sanitizer. I mean, some places I go, I was like, you know, I'm walking around looking, where, where's that stuff? I want that stuff, you know, or, or having it as abundant as possible. Um, and, and one could run sort of a, a forearm sort of, you could even do maybe 16 arm factorial design and really get a sense of, well, how much incremental benefit you get from masks? How much do you get from face masks? Maybe face mask, no mask, um, maybe hand sanitizer, no hand sanitizer. So you can ask all these questions. Um, I think what surprised me about the pandemic was that some of the people should have been pushing governments to do that study. We're instead pushing the governments to just do some of those things. Ironically, not all of those things. They they weren't. They don't equally seduce the mind. I mean, um, the, the, the plexi, the, the face shield idea. That's. I don't think that, that really got the campaign that the the cloth on the on the mouth gets. Um, so you know, I wonder what your thoughts on that. Uh, was it a missed opportunity to do a very big study? Um, and and why are, are we drawn to some things and not other things? Um, you know, based on the. Yeah, I don't know. I suspect there's lots of reasons. I think people quite often want to do things. You know, it's it's always easier to do things and to campaign for something. I was asked, um, I think late January, early February, if I would join the call to government to mandate masks. And I'd said, well, I'm absolutely delighted to call for trials. I would yeah. love to get behind that. I would really love to get. And I was told that wasn't the, that wasn't what's going to happen. That's not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt really disappointed because um, many people I really admire, um, you know, and still in many ways admire, but um, but really, really admire had had very much taken up this as a mantle, and I can understand that people want to do something. There's a general fearfulness. There's some panic. There's some alarm. I can understand people who think that well, the, the side effects must be very small. Therefore, we'll just go ahead and, and do this. And, and I can see the reasoning, but I think that evidence-based medicine is even more important in a pandemic. It's even more important to do things by what we know works. It's really more important to think about our biases and to think about unintended consequences because it's a pandemic. And I think that if we're not doing things at the time of greatest need, we're really doing everyone a disservice. And I know that sounds really harsh and it sounds like I'm kind of being unsympathetic and I'm sorry if it does, but we have missed so many opportunities, but there's still time to do things. Yeah. You know, and for example, in schools, you know, there's this controversy, should children wear masks in schools, going between corridors, do a trial, there you go. Um, you know, but university students, how should they be taught? Should they be doing you know, wearing face masks when they're in lecture theatres is social distancing enough. Do a trial, you know, and I, I just think we've got all these opportunities that are slipping by us and we're going to be no better off. And then if we do get through COVID, well, when the next pandemic comes, we'll still be having the same arguments. I would really love to see alongside all the plans for future randomised controlled trials of drugs for pandemics to put in all the non-drug intervention trials to get them set up now. I know that they're in, in, in Norway. I know that they're primed to do a, a cluster trial plus randomised control trial of school children going back to school if the schools have to go off again. Um, and I know that they found it very difficult to get um, you know, permission to do that yeah. um, politically, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah. It's so much the right thing to do. I, I, I want, sometimes wonder that we look back at how pandemics, which have plagued humanity for as long as there's been humanity, um, we look back on old pandemics and we say, oh, wow, look how dumb they were. They didn't even know the culprit organism. You know, they didn't know what the cause of their pandemic was. They certainly instituted a number of draconian measures that had nothing to do with that. They demonized and perhaps even ethnic minorities. They demonized the other, which is something that people do when they're scared. And, you know, and look how bad those civilizations were. And then, you know, look at us. We're better. I, I don't want to say we're not, but we're clearly better. But think about a thousand years from now when they look back at us and they'll say, my goodness, look at them. 
They didn't do any studies. They um, let 97% of the people um, with the disease not even be on trial for a therapy. And certainly they did no trials to actually slow the spread. They shut down everything. Um, They kept it shut down. They were politically divided. Ha 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 ha. They will laugh and say, uh, you know, I really do think that sometimes we forget. We think we're we're sort of the telos of of the of humanity. Um, a hundred years from now, they'll look back and they'll say, "What were you thinking?" Just as we look back a hundred years ago and think how primitive those responses were. Yeah, I agree. And I think the problem is that right now we know that that's how people are going to look at. Look, I know. Look yeah, at. I know. there are a few of us who that, already are know that, that, right? <laughs> We have, we have that insight, but what did you do next? And I think there was there was work done. I think it wasn't there after Ebola, and um, where they basically found that they hadn't done enough randomised control trials into um, drug interventions, so they don't have any additional treatments to offer people that that will, will get the Ebola again in the future. And I understand there's been another outbreak in in Africa just now. So it's really it's really it's not just the lack of trials; it's the lack of information that you then generate for the future. So you've done harm not just to people now. But to people in the future as well, to, to the next time this happens, you know, and I think that, you know, researchers, healthcare professionals, we have a responsibility, not just just now, but in the future as well, the legacy that we leave. Yeah, that's well put. Now, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about schools, because it's such an interesting and complex issue, um, certainly on this side of the pond. Um, so what we're what we're doing is... Um, you know, we've always suffered from profound socioeconomic inequalities and racial inequalities. And so we have always had sort of almost even a three-tier school system. We have private schools for rich people. Um, I always say I'm not quite rich, but I'm on my way to being rich. And I'm friends with a lot of rich people and so as a physician. So I talk to them. And, you know, every time I talk to a doctor, I say, well, you know, how are schools going? How are you going to clinic? You know, how do you, you know, who's taking care of your kids while you're in clinic? And they're like, yeah, schools are closed where I live. Well, except my kids' school, because I send my kids to private school, so they're going full steam ahead. And then the next level is these charter schools, magnet schools. These are sort of um, typically right-wing people in this country have pushed for um, school choice, school options. Um, I think folks who are on the progressive wing have always complained that that's to erode public schools by taking the wealthy parents out of districts and putting them in choice schools and letting the school give some sort of voucher or kick or payment to that choice school. But a lot of those schools, again, their financial incentives are different. Um, they are, uh, may not have school teacher unions and those sorts of things. And they're, they're, they're running um, in person too, to some degree. And then we talk about public schools. And in this country, um, the public school situation is not even uniform. There's no real federal authority to mandate things across the land. So what you have is pockets where people believe in Donald J. Trump, they're more likely to open than pockets where people disagree with him. Um, they're less likely to open. So it really does have some sort of ideological valence to it. Um, and, and you know, I don't know if you follow as closely as I've been following and talking to people about sort of the, the massive literature about COVID-19 in kids. Um, that they're less likely to acquire the virus, that they're, uh, that in, in that whether or not they spread it or contribute to spread appears to be far different than things like influenza and things like that. So I guess I guess my question is, um, so like right now in the United States, we still have schools are halted, but not for everyone, for poor kids, for minority kids. Um, how should we think through this decision that we're making? It's a policy decision we're making every day to keep another day, no kids in school. Um, we can, They can try to do these Zoom things, but I think, um, you know, I like to say, I joke, uh, you know, getting a two-year-old to wear a mask, it's like getting a dog to wear pants. Uh, you know, you can mandate it, but I don't know what you're going to do. And getting a, I think getting a young child to sit in front of Zoom for hours a day, that's also a tall task. And I think people trivialize how difficult that may be. Um, so what are your thoughts on schools? I wonder if you could walk us through how we should prioritize and when they should open those things. Yeah. Well, these are, these are my opinions. Yes. <laughs> So, so, it's, so in the UK, we, there's it, interesting, a similar kind of thing. So there's the private schools, which are the parents pay for, for the child to go to school. And um, they, they have done lots of things. So I live quite close to a private school where my kids don't go. And um, they, have, they have these marquees that they've erected outside and special porta cabins, temporary rooms, so they can distribute their kids. And certainly those schools, um, when they were when the big lockdown <laughs> happened, they were still running lessons by Zoom, whereas um, most of the state schools were just set lessons for the kids to hand in if they had an electronic device and internet access to hand in and I suppose that what, what I'm concerned about is that we're not cause we're not counting all the harms on equal sides so there's some parents who feel very strongly that school shouldn't reopen it's too dangerous kids will bring back COVID into the household they or someone they love is at high risk and they, they don't want that to happen 
But then, of course, there's the consequences of children not being in school. Um, school might be the only place they get to eat um, during the day. Um, we know that calls to domestic abuse helplines and to child protection helplines have gone up. Um, certainly, there were reports on that in the last few days. Um, you know, I haven't seen all the data on that, but, but certainly that would chime with what I've been told by local contacts that I have uh, contacts with, um, you know, health visitors, you know, district nurses, that, that kind of thing. And, and I don't think we're counting that properly just now. So it's hard to know for sure what's happening, but there certainly are concerns with some groups of children who are vulnerable. And um, there's also the concern about a generation just not having the same friendship, the same playtimes, same physical activities, the same um, collegiate nature of, of your friends at school. And all those things I think are really important and, and have to be added into the mix. I can completely understand, though, and many teachers being fearful of, of going back to teach. I completely get that. And those teachers might have health issues themselves. They might have colleagues who they're concerned about. They might have family people at home um, that they're concerned about as well. So I understand all of that. But you're absolutely right. You, we need the proper data. And we know that children are at very low risk of having COVID. We know we're doing this huge amount of testing in the under 11s who have normal viral right. um, winter illnesses. We know that hardly any of them are testing positive. And right. Yet we know that adults who are symptomatic can't get tests. If it was up to me, I think I would make the argument that under 11s, you know, yeah, don't so, test. So, yeah, so rarely have, have COVID um, and will so rarely do any damage if they do have COVID. That it's kind of, you know, not not a priority, even might even be a deep priority to kind of test them. You know, so I, I mean, I, I, I'm worried that schools were out for so long during the first lockdown. And I really feel that should be an absolute priority is to get kids back to school particularly children who are carrying more more disadvantage i think they absolutely have to i think if there are concerns you could do a step wedge trial for yes, example and make right, sure yeah. that you get everyone reassurance you could easily do that um i don't see any reason why you couldn't do that um if you think the evidence is, is uncertain for and i'd be more concerned about you know reassuring teachers i think and parents more than anything else so you could gather that data but mm. otherwise um it has to be a priority, you know, um, you know, say, same as, you know, people in nursing homes, you know, we know that that's where the biggest risk is carried and that's where, you know, the most thought has to go into in order to protect people who don't want to get exposed to it. But there's another issue as well, which I think is people in the last couple of years of life, people who know that they're reaching the end of their life because of a disease process very much the, the advice to them has been to shield you know to um hide away not to see anybody the, for the first few months it was to stay in a room on your own is that humane you know um i think people are um capable intelligent people in the main who will want to make their own decisions and i think that for many people it has been unbearable what they've been asked to do and i think if if I knew anyway that I was in the last stages of my life, I would want to think carefully about what decisions I was making and what it was that was important to me. Because I think we've offered people very binary, very dogmatic choices. And that hasn't included values. It hasn't included what the person themselves wants to do. And knowing that you're at high risk of death doesn't necessarily mean that you'll want to make a decision that everybody else is making or you think everyone else is going to make. Right. And one of my big concerns is that we haven't been upfront enough about that. We haven't had nuanced discussions with many people that I think would have been useful. I mean, one of the things that might sound perverse, but I really take pride in delivering good palliative care to people. And I have felt, um, I have really felt very, um, very troubled by how that's gone over the last few months. I just don't think it's worked out in an optimal way in many instances. And I have huge regret over um, perhaps my lack of, my lack of, um, my, la my lack of um, confidence, I suppose, in having much more robust discussions about people about what you really want to do at this point and, and where you would like to, where you would like to take risks and where you wouldn't like to take risks. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, getting, getting this subject in the future, you know, coming around to palliative care discussions, I'm really aiming to be much more thoughtful, I think, about how we discuss risk and what people would and wouldn't like to do. Sorry, that's all off subject. I'm no, just... no, no, this is all very, very good stuff. I think you know one of the themes I've I've observed from from just talking to you for the last twenty minutes or so is every time I toss something to you and 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 you you are uncertain um, your response is to say 
you know, your general thoughts, but then also to say, well, you could do a step wedge trial. You could do that. So I guess at every juncture, you know, in terms of your thought process, what you think about is if there is uncertainty, and I will concede in a lot of these situations, there is uncertainty. The next best thing from just doing it or just blindly not doing it is to do it slowly, incrementally, stepwise, and have certain stopping rules and go rules to expand and to contract. Um, you you really believe that that's all, that's that's a sort of a philosophy that guides you more than any other philosophy in the space of of COVID nineteen. Well, just in life. In you life, know, ah, yeah. Yeah. So, well, it's not it's not great, is it? Um, you can't just choose between two different pairs of shoes when you buy them both. <laughs> take them both home but but you know when I started off in general practice I thought it was a feeling if I didn't know what to do all the yeah. time I really felt as though I should know everything all the time at once and it's taken me like more than 20 years to realize actually not knowing stuff is normal and the problems arise when you think you know stuff and you don't you make the wrong, wrong assumptions and I think for some people that might look as though you're being very woolly you're not being very definite I remember um, I remember one of my favorite registrars when I was um, when I was a junior doctor saying to me in terms of exams you know be wrong, but never in doubt. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's, that the, that's the, the saying of medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and it's taken me a long time to realize actually that's a really not helpful. Not helpful. Kind of philosophy. So it takes, I think, it takes a long time to feel confident and comfortable enough to say I don't know. And it might sound like quite a small, stupid thing, but actually, it's really helpful yeah. because it means that you kind of lose some of the angst about not knowing stuff, and you kind of lose some of the fearfulness. Of about not knowing stuff and I'm sure there's more stuff I should know that I don't but equally um, we live in an age now where the internet is you know I remember Index Medicus you're too young for this <laughs> but you see this, this um, you know this like 25 volume um, sort of case in the library which was if you wanted to look up a journal title do you know what I'm talking about you don't know what I'm no, talking I about this journal talking about Okay, so see if you wanted to look something up, a yeah. paper, you wanted to look up a paper, you had to go and look it up an Index Medica. So this like, and it was like him, um, the yellow pages, you're also too young for that. Really thin paper, <laughs> really thin paper, and you would have to flick through it and find it. And then you would have to work out the journal and you would have to go to the floor in the library where the journal was. Invariably, it wouldn't be there. It would, in frank way, it would take about 20, 25, 30 sure. minutes to find one paper. You know, so maybe you did need to know more things then. I don't know. But now, now you have Google and you have PubMed and you can look that up really quickly. So I suppose part of part of the way I think the culture of medicine has changed is that you don't need to learn anatomy by rote. Now it's okay to go and look up something that you don't yes, know. You I can't agree. have that muscle. Go, go and look it up, you know, and the skills now are about finding evidence, interpreting evidence, working out whether that fits the patient in front of you, trying to work out a compromise because it's never going to be perfect evidence and it's never going to be, the, the patient's never going to fit exactly into the, the group of people that were done, you know, that that research was done on. So I think the skills have changed and with that, I think there is room to be um, more confident in our uncertainty and hopefully safer as a result of that. I agree with everything you said, and I think that that really puts it nicely why you should, uh, and even it speaks to my philosophy of medical education, how we should retool it to give people the tools to find what they need and, and interpret what they see rather than uh, blindly memorize a lot of things that you're going to forget in a few years and realize you don't know. Um, in terms of your specific school opening study, I really do like it. I think it's a it's a very parsimonious way. I think the one of the one of the ironies is that it, it should be something that gets both proponents of erring on the side of opening and opponents together. The irony is it sometimes put, repels them both because neither get what they want, which is sort of the misunderstanding of what studies do. Um, the only thing I would add to that is. Um, whenever whatever stopping rules one comes up with, one should be cautious that the stopping rule um, is not an arbitrary break. Uh, by that I mean if if what they if the stopping rule is every child is going to get nasal swabs three times a week, and anytime we find PCR COVID, we're going to halt the whole thing. Um, versus people presenting with symptomatic COVID and coming in sick, I think I think one stopping rule might be too zealous. Um, that, that that looking just for PCR PCR based swab positivity, you want a stopping rule that actually tells you that there's a real harm to people and it's going in a direction you don't want. Similarly, the go rules, um, you know, I guess well, actually no, I guess I guess the go rules are just as long as you don't have the stopping rules, you go. What are your yeah, thoughts on that? Yeah, and you would agree them before you start as well. Yes, yes. One of the ways you can do this kind of thing, and and I'm sure you've come across them, is these citizens juries. 
you know, where you get people that represent your community and you bring them together and you give really high quality education yes. and information to them. You bring them along experts, they can quiz the experts, you know, you, you get lots of information to people who are community members, lay people who become very quickly acquainted with the evidence and where the uncertainties are. And there's been really great stuff done in this. And Paul Bazu in Australia, he did this fantastic um, study about men who were in, in prostate cancer screening and brought them together. And they had this really amazing educational sort of um, session over a few days. And then they worked out how people's opinions had changed about whether PSA screening was a good idea or ah, not. Ah, yes. I, and years ago, when NICE was being set up, I was asked to come and give evidence to um, the, the citizens' jury that was being set up for NICE to talk about quality of life measures and what things should be included and not in that and the difficulty and, and benefit of, of looking at some of these indicators. And you get these fantastic group of people who really are wanting to know things about a subject that they've never come across before. Yes. You know, they've been randomly selected. And again, in Scotland, we had a citizen's jury to discuss the realistic medicine agenda. And again, a group of people who, cut you, who are randomly selected to represent in um, Scotland I get fantastic information and are then asked to go ahead. And so I think using a model like yes. that can be really useful because you're you're helping people to engage fully with all the information, yes. treating people like they're intelligent, yes. capable, autonomous people. And, and soliciting the values them. and preferences of a community. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also understanding so that, and again, another organization I've got huge respect for is the James Lind Alliance. Yes. I don't know if you've heard of them, yeah, but they of bring together researchers and um, patients or family members, carers, and work out what the priorities are for research. And then just hammer it out together. You know, what's important to patients? What do researchers feel that they need to know? How do they generate a way forward? So, again, I think hugely important work. And, and, and what happens when you properly engage people, when you don't just sort of say with well, the patient voice and invite someone, but actually really get people together in the same room and work out the difficult bits, not just do the nice, easy things. Dr. McCartney, that was a terrific, I think, overview of your article. I'm going to refer interested listeners to Margaret McCartney. We need better evidence on non-drug interventions for COVID-19. It came out at the end of August in 2020. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I'd love to have you back in the future. It was great to meet you, Vinny. Thanks for having me. So I'm back in plenary session, joined via Zoom by Dr. Jason Seltzer. Dr. Seltzer works at Cold Spring Harbor, and he is a budding independent investigator in cancer research. He's not an assistant professor, he was telling me. He has some other title called Independent Fellow, which I think is unfair because Dr. Seltzer is doing some of the most interesting science in cancer biology, that, I, that at, least, at least in my opinion. I've been following his work eagerly for the last few years. You know, you know you like somebody when you set your Google alert to let yourself know whenever they have a new article. And so I did that with Dr. Seltzer uh, many, maybe maybe three, four, five years ago. Um, and I've been following uh, with, with great interest. And we're going to talk about a lot of that work today. So Dr. Seltzer, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Finn. I am happy to be here. So you are a cancer biology researcher. And you've done a number of provocative papers, and I guess I guess I'm just going to jump in with one of your provocative papers, um, because for the interest of time and also to get get right into the meat of the issue, um, why don't you tell listeners? Well, I, I'll try to summarize it as poorly as I can, and and you and for full disclosure, you should know I'm a I'm a clinician. I see patients with blood and 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 solid cancers. I'm not a laboratory scientist. I'm very dumb about that. Very, very dumb. I don't know too much. So you're gonna have to break it down for me as if as if you're speaking to someone who is very junior. You, I know you have some trainees in your laboratory. Let's take it down a few more steps lower than that than you got me. Um, so this paper, as I understood it, was a really elegant paper that you published in Science Translational Medicine, where you picked a number of candidate compounds that had demonstrated that they were promising anti-cancer drugs. And for each of these candidate compounds, there was a story people like to tell. They like to say, this drug works by this mechanism. You went in and you neutralized all those mechanisms of action so that you know, if the drug works via that mechanism, that mechanism is no longer a driver in this cancer cell. I have completely removed that as a driver. Then you tested the drugs again. You found a bunch of them still worked, which can only mean one thing. It didn't work the way you thought it did. And in one case, you really elegantly show how it works instead. Uh, is, that a, is that an apt summary of this paper? Yeah, that's a very accurate summary. So tell us about it. So, so what, what motivated you to ask this question and, and how did you ask it? 
So the, the story comes about in a roundabout way. Initially, we were doing some data analysis, looking for genes that could potentially be prognostic biomarkers in cancer. Mm -hmm. We were looking for genes that were overexpressed in deadly tumors, which we thought maybe were drivers of metastasis or immune evasion or aggressive disease or things like that. Um, and so we did some bioinformatic work. We came out with a list of genes to study, and then we started studying them in the lab. And in addition to studying uh, the genes that we had selected, we also picked a few positive control genes to mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. We wanted genes which were reported to be important for cancer growth and proliferation so that we knew that our assays in the lab were working because uh, if you ablated a gene that was important for cancer growth, the cancer cells would die, and then we'd know that the experiments we were doing were working correctly. I see. We started setting up some of these experiments, uh, and it seemed like all of our positive controls were failing to work. Hmm. We were trying to get rid of the expression of certain genes which had been reported to play a role in cancer proliferation. Uh, we knocked them out using uh, CRISPR gene editing, and the cancer cells kept growing just fine. I see. So we we kept repeating these assays and getting the same results. And eventually we ended up switching our focus uh, instead of studying these biomarker genes, which we were initially investigated in, we started studying these genes where we were unable to uh, recapitulate what had been published in the literature. I see. And then we decided to focus on that. So I'm wondering if you, so when, when, uh, you know, people, this podcast, I hope they know what CRISPR means, but, um, but they may not. Um, my understanding of CRISPR was, you know, it's a really elegant thing that was discovered a long time ago, which was that bacteria, which really have no immune system, they can't, of course, they're single cell organisms, they've somehow found a way that if the same virus or bacteriophage infected them over and over again, they would find a way to develop a sort of immunity so that they wouldn't, you know, have sort of bad things happen to them if the same bacteriophage came around again. And it turned out, people tried to figure out why do they have that immunity? And the way they had that immunity was that they actually cleave chunks of those viral genomes and keep it in their own genome and they use these these sort of pop, um these cyclical repeating the the crispr part of it the the abbreviation uh to demarcate where they are storing the viral genome and then they have these proteins like cas9 which um can recognize that uh, template and cleave it so that if they ever get infected again with this bit of dna that they've saved um they know to go and cut those up and those are the bacteriophages out there and and somebody realized that Okay, I hope my summary is accurate because I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, somebody realized that um, that this is really useful because if the bacteria has a way that any stretch of DNA that you that they can remember and know to cut, you can take that protein and apply it to anything you want in the genome and cut the genome wherever you want, not just where restriction enzymes cut the genome. Okay, what do I have right? What do I have wrong? What is and so yeah, that's how they right. figured out CRISPR. That's uh, entirely correct. And uh, researchers later found that you could transgenically express the Cas9 protein and the guide RNA to target Cas9 in mammalian cells. And just like it works in bacteria, the Cas9 transgenically expressed would cut a gene uh, that you're targeting. And so that uh, produces a very simple and straightforward mechanism of generating human cells in a petri dish that totally lack the expression of a gene you're interested in studying. And why is it, and it's so much better than the old way of restriction enzymes because you can cut any any sequence you want, not just where God happened to or nature happened to create us the restriction enzymes. And it's incredibly specific. I so see. with, with a, a transgenically supplied guide RNA, you have 20 nucleotides that you can use to precisely target a, re a region of interest and it is much harder to do that using older technologies. I see. And so what you're saying is people had said that these uh, genetic locations are important for oncogenesis. They drive tumor growth and proliferation. You went in and you cut many of these out and you found that this cancer is growing unabated. I guess one question I have for you is what if the other person were to say something like, well, you know, we never said it was this gene alone that drives cancer. It's in concert with the other genes. And so naturally there'll be compensatory mechanism or what if they said that it's just homology? There's another thing that looks just like it, and it's going to pick up the slack. How, how, how would you sort of think about those questions? Yeah, those are really excellent questions. And I think that the, the problem with those explanations comes in from a therapeutic perspective, which is previous researchers had <clears throat> identified these genes as important for cancer growth and then 
those same researchers or others in the pharmaceutical industry tried to develop small molecule drugs I to see. inhibit those specific proteins. I see. Uh, and many of those drugs then went on to enter clinical trials in cancer patients. I see. And so if there is some compensatory mechanism or some homolog that can substitute, well, if your drug doesn't actually Fair deal point. with that compensatory mechanism, Fair then point. it'll just fail to, to help patients in the clinic. Fair point. You're, so that's a very apt point, which is what you're saying is not only are they saying this is important for cancer, they're saying this is so important, I'm going to drug it. And for that to be true, the compensatory mechanisms can't overcome it. Otherwise, what's the point of the drug? Right. So you're absolutely right. OK, so that's a terrific point. OK, so so you 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 did this. This started out by, you know, by being a good scientist. You you didn't recapitulate what other people had found. You started to verify that you found these challenges and then you thought well this may have some broad implications um let me bi pick a set of and here's what i want to ask you so how did you pick these drugs you picked these th that you decided you wanted to test i i forget maybe 10 drugs or something like that yep so we used a few criteria to select drugs and drug targets to study one was that we wanted to study proteins that had been reported to play a cell autonomous role in cancer mm. growth that is proteins which were reportedly responsible for cancer cells going from one cell to two cells to four cells in a petri dish. So that meant we excluded drugs that were meant to target the tumor microenvironment or angiogenesis or things like that, which are much harder to study in a petri dish. Uh, the second criteria was that we wanted drugs or drug targets where drugs had been reported to specifically inhibit them. That is, there are multiple uh, small molecules out there that are known to have multiple targets. Some of them are effective, some of them are not effective. And we specifically chose targets that have been reported to be uh, inhibited by single drugs. Mm. And then the last piece of the puzzle was that we think that the gold standard for knowing what a cancer drug does is if you have a mutation in some target that grants resistance to it. Yes. The standard example here is Gleevec and the mutations in the Abel kinase that confer resistance to Gleevec. That's really strong genetic evidence that Gleevec is working through Abel inhibition, because if you introduce this mutation in Abel, then Gleevec no longer works. Sure. But a majority of drugs that enter clinical trials don't actually have that level of genetic evidence supporting them. And so we use that as a criterion to weed out some of the better validated compounds and targets. Oh, I see. I see. So, so you would so so if a drug existed and people said it worked under X circumstances, but the moment it acquires this point mutation, the drug doesn't hit the binding pocket, therefore it doesn't work. Those are drugs you're saying, okay, that's good science. You you've shown that it it hits this target. You've also shown when the target is altered, it it doesn't work anymore. You've done these kind of two steps. You exclude those. You pick the ones where people just think it hits the target, and that's the mechanism by which it works. Yep. That, so that was our initial motivation. Okay. And then along the way, while completing this project, we tested some of those published resistance mutations. And in every instance where we tested a published resistance mutation, uh, we were able to verify what was published. So we do think uh, in our own hands, as well as in the literature, a genetic resistance mutation is the gold standard for knowing a drug's true target. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. So give me just one example of a drug for which people are right about the resistance mechanisms? Um, so we there are small molecule uh, compounds that reportedly block the interaction between MDM2 and P53. MDM2 okay. is a negative regulator P53 signaling, and okay. blocking the interaction leads to P53 hyperactivation. Uh, and we found, and so uh, Idasa Nutlin and Nutlin are, are compounds that have been developed to be MDM2 P53 inhibitors. We knock out P53, we block the activity of those compounds on cancer cell lines in vitro. I see. And and then the acquired mechanism of resistance is mutation in P53 or MDM2? Uh, P53. I see. Yeah. I see. That so prevents... we knock out P53 gotcha. using CRISPR, and then there's nothing for the drug to act on. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Fair point. Um, okay. So, so the 10 that you pursued in your paper were mm -hmm. 10 where um, people had not offered resistance mutations. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and and the other interesting thing about it was that all of them are, are compounds that are, um, they're in the drug pipeline. None are FDA approved. Fair right. enough. Okay. And so, and so what did you find? So we found that we could use CRISPR to knock out the putative targets of these drugs 
Uh, we made knockouts in multiple cell lines and melanoma cell lines and breast cancer cell lines and colorectal cancer cell lines. And first, the knockout cells that we generated grew totally fine. So that right off the bat is kind of a, a red flag that there's something wrong here. Yeah. Because these are proteins that are supposed to be driving cancer growth, according to the literature. Uh, but we eliminate them using CRISPR and the cancer cells continue to divide just fine. Let me ask you a question and, there real quick. Yep. When, when you say they divide, divide just fine, does that mean they divide at the exact same rate as before? Or you can't really tell that with, with precision? Uh, so I guess the most accurate thing I can say is we did not detect a statistically gotcha. significant difference in, in how growth. growth. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, go on. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so that's a problem. That's a problem. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we had all of these uh, anti-cancer drugs, which are being given to cancer patients. And we wanted and we tested the sensitivity of cell lines in which their target had been knocked out. And we compared that sensitivity to control cell lines. So if you have a drug that is reported to function by inhibiting protein A or inhibiting <laughs> protein B or something like that, if you get rid of protein A, then that drug should have nothing to bind to in right. the cell and it shouldn't have any activity. Unfortunately, what we found was that for a large number of these drugs, we treated the cells that totally lacked the drug's target with the drug and the drug still killed them. So that mechanism that the drug must be inhibiting protein A or inhibiting protein B, well, if it's still it killing cancer cells that lack protein A or lack protein B, then it necessarily has some other cellular target, which is actually responsible for its anti-cancer activity. That's well put and, and so logical. And, and when, when, it, when these drugs, so they continue to kill the cell, which is problematic if that's the reason why it's killing the cell. Um, I mean, I guess the first thing is problematic if you remove that target and the cancer grows unabated, it's probably not a great target. And second, um, the drug still kills the cell. It's not working through that target for sure. But I guess my question would be, um, uh, when, did it still kill the cell at the same rate of killing the cell? Can you quantify that? So yeah. In our uh, in vitro drug sensitivity assay, so of course in, in vitro is a significant caveat. You know, it's not the same as doing it in a, in a mouse or in a person. But in drug sensitivity assays conducted in Petri dishes, uh, we did not detect a statistically significant difference in the effective concentration of the drug in wild type cells compared to target knockout cells. I see. Now tell me about the one example, at least from, I read this paper many months ago. Um, I remember there's one clear example where you found the real target, um, but maybe it was more than one. Um, uh, how did you do that work and, and what was that drug? Yeah. Yep. Um, so to, to kind of lead into that, while we were doing this work, we were thinking about where some of this earlier research had potentially gone wrong. Yeah. And a lot of this earlier research had relied on biochemical and biophysical approaches to characterize the cancer drugs. Uh, they had shown, for instance, that the drug inhibited in protein A or inhibited protein B in a test tube yeah. biochemically. Yeah. But just because that inhibition occurs in a test tube, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's relevant to what's actually going on in a cancer cell. Yeah. So we thought that um, going back to what we discussed earlier, that maybe the best way to get at the mechanisms of cancer drugs is to figure out what's going on in a cancer cell uh, through the derivation of resistance granting mutations. That is, if we can generate a cancer cell, which for some reason no longer responds to a drug when you treat it with that drug, then maybe that has some mutation in the binding pocket or some mutation that's blocking whatever it is that the drug is actually targeting. Right. So we decided that rather than taking a biochemical approach to characterizing these drugs, we could take a genetic approach instead and try to derive resistance granting mutations. I see. We were able to successfully do that with one compound. I see. And what was that compound? So the compound is called OTS-964. It is mm -hmm. a small molecule drug that was developed by a Japanese company. Mm -hmm. um, and it was reported to inhibit one protein kinase. We knocked the protein kinase out and the cancer cells mm -hmm. didn't care. <laughs> but when we did this cellular evolution experiment mm -hmm. to try and mm -hmm. uh, derive resistant clones, we were able to find uh, every, we harvested resistant clones. And when we did whole exome sequencing on them, Everyone had a mutation in the kinase pocket of the cyclin-dependent kinase CDK11. I see. 
And so CDK11 is a homolog of CDK4 and 6, which are targeted by palbociclib, abemaciclib, and breast cancer. Yeah. So this is a family that's been recognized as important for cancer biology, but uh, there had been no previous known inhibitors of that kinase. I see. Uh, we did some follow-up experiments, and we were able to verify uh, that OTS964, this drug we were studying, was actually functioning as a CDK11 inhibitor yes, rather than as an inhibitor of the protein it had been initially designed against. I see. So I guess one of the takeaway points of your work in this space is that you believe that um, if companies really want to know for sure that drug A works through target A, the best thing they can do is put mutations in target A to sh until drug A doesn't work anymore. Um, that these other types of assays that they do are not very reliable, um, but actually mutating the target or, or removing the target entirely, that's a better way to know it works through that way. So I, I would say that the other assays are reliable, but not conclusive. I see. Okay. Um, you know, a, a drug may inhibit 50 different proteins I in a test tube, uh, but maybe only one or two of those is actually relevant to its cancer killing activity. So it's th these biochemical assays can produce reliable results, but just insufficient to really know what a drug's doing in the cell. I see. Now, one of the things about your paper was when I looked at the list of compounds, I didn't recognize any. So that tells me that they maybe they're not they're, F they're not FDA approved compounds. But um, one wonders if you took some FDA approved compounds and you did this, is it possible we're going to find out some of those FDA approved drugs don't work through the standard mechanism or are those drugs usually have those resistant mechanisms? Like I know, for instance, like ibrutinib, the BTK inhibitor, there's this big literature on the resistance mechanisms, you know, BCR-ABLE inhibitors. Not only is there the mechanism we can actually see like panatinib fits in the binding pocket and those sorts of things, um, even even with T315i and those sorts of things. But some of these, I, I'm not really aware of a literature on the resistance mechanism. So is it possible that some approved drugs don't work the way we think they do? Uh, I, I think it's certainly possible. I see. I, I think we also... Um, we, we can kind of go one level deeper here okay. and, and think about more complicated mechanisms by which cancer drugs work. Mm -hmm. uh, in this paper, we tested maybe the most straightforward explanation for precision therapies in cancer. Drug X inhibits protein A and that kills cancer cells. Right. I think people are also recognizing that polypharmacology is very important uh, for the activity of certain cancer drugs. That is maybe a drug in... Uh, that's used for cancer patients inhibits 10 proteins and all of them have some function yes. uh, promoting cancer growth and you need to hit all of them to have an anti-cancer activity. So I think that when you start thinking about polypharmacology in more complicated ways that cancer drugs work, it's likely that we don't have a complete picture for how drugs work, even for the drugs that are FDA approved and regularly used in the clinic. I see. I mean, the drugs I think of that are clearly that way are the dirty uh, or promiscuous tyrosine kinase inhibitors right. like serafinib, serafinib, yeah, yeah. serafinib, right. yeah. sunitinib. Mm -hmm. They just hit. When you see that tyrosine kinome light up, you're like, oh, crap, that's like a quarter of the kinome is lighting up. Um, mm -hmm. And then people, you know, I, I remember the in, in the boom days of tyrosine kinase inhibitors back in the early 2000s, everyone thought that the more targeted we get, the better. Um, but there were a few people who wrote early commentaries that said, let's not be so hasty. For some of these tumors, it might actually be being a little bit of a dirty drug helps you. Um, and, and in fact, for some things like HCC, it's always been the sort of drugs that hit a bunch of targets. So you're saying that that could well be clinically useful to hit everything a little bit weakly. Yeah, I think that's a big unknown right now. Okay. Uh, but it, it, it could be a mechanism to explain uh, why some drugs that hit the same target ostensibly behave very differently when you actually put them in people. The other paper that this reminds me of, and it, it sounds as if it was linked that way in your mind as well, was um, a paper that you published in eLife, which I thought was really provocative because you put out a, a Twitter thread about it, which, um, you know, was, I think, almost went, by these standards of these threads, it went viral. Let's just say that because this is, this is cancer biology, but it went viral. And I think what, I mean, you can explain it, but I guess my understanding of it, my simple understanding was it, you looked at TCGA, um, that, this cancer genomic atlas, and you looked at a bunch of things, copy number, um, 
problems and, and, and mutations that people thought were good or bad. Um, and you, you look to see like, what would you think about this mutation if you just looked at sort of the observational data? And then what do we know about whether or not these mutations are worth drugging? And you really pointed out some paradoxes that some things that look like they were good prognostic were actually good to drug. And some things that look like they were poor prognostic were actually not good to drug. And I wonder if you might walk us through that and what made you do this and how you think about it. Yeah. So I think there is a, a common phenomenon in cancer literature. Uh, if you're characterizing some gene in cancer, you write a paper, figure one, two, and three are doing experiments in vitro, figure four is maybe a mouse xenograft experiment, and then figure five is Kaplan-Meier curves from TCGA data yeah. saying when this gene is mutated or when this gene is highly expressed or amplified, patients have a poor prognosis, this is in vivo proof that this is an important cancer driver. Uh, but actually, when you go back and look in TCGA or other cancer survival studies, where you can compare gene expression with patient prognosis or mutations with patient prognosis, there's actually a pretty significant disconnect between what we actually realize are strong cancer drivers uh, and what's associated with poor prognosis in the clinic. Mm. So to give a few examples, uh, the estrogen receptor, yeah. the most important breast cancer driver, the most important uh, drug target in breast cancer, overexpression of the estrogen receptor is actually in many cases Favorable. associated with better prognosis yeah. in breast cancer because triple negative breast cancer, which doesn't express the estrogen receptor, happens to be more aggressive and is currently undruggable. Um, another example of that is uh, mutations in KRAS. Mutations in KRAS, that's, you know, the prototypical oncogene, drives tumor genesis in multiple organs, but it happens to be that in many cancers, uh, mutations in KRAS, patients who have mutations in KRAS have the same prognosis as patients whose tumors don't have mutations in KRAS, just because those tumors are likely activating the KRAS pathway downstream or upstream or somewhere else. I see. So when you go through and when you look at these verified oncogenes and verified drug targets, they don't always have the survival patterns that you'd expect. And because of that, I think that this, this common practice of using Kaplan-Meier data to support uh, particular genes as cancer drivers or to, you know, to hammer home the in vivo relevance of a gene you're studying that's not always supported by what we know about cancer. I see. It's a very astute point because, I mean, what you're really saying is that, um, you know, if you if you only looked at those curves, you'd say estrogen receptor good, no estrogen receptor bad, everything we can do fueling estrogen pathway signaling will help cancer. But of course, right. it's the opposite. In the estrogen right. receptor population, um, if, you, if you inhibit that signaling, you get a benefit because that's the driver of outcomes and the outcomes aren't as bad as a population that really biologically has a really different kind of cancer. Um, yep. Okay. So, so the real relevant question is um, simply because something looks worse than you know another slice of the same tumor doesn't necessarily mean it's a good or bad target. Being a good or bad target is simply whether or not you drug it, things get better, or whether or not they get worse. Yeah. yeah. That's an excellent point. Um, and then how does it fit in with copy number? I looked at, co there's something about that paper in copy number, I thought. Yeah, so uh, we found that while we showed that there are many mutations in driver oncogenes, which were perhaps surprisingly not strongly correlated with patient prognosis, copy number changes in a lot of oncogenes and tumor suppressors was correlated with patient prognosis. And when you look a little more closely, uh, so it seems like copy number changes tend to occur later in tumor development. So oftentimes maybe a mutation in RAS or mutation in P53 is one of the early steps. And then later on uh, in more advanced cancers, you tend to see amplifications of oncogenes. Um, and more complex structural rearrangements like aneuploidies where you gain extra copies of entire chromosomes. And we pointed out that these uh, lesions tend to be gained in advanced malignancies. And while I think we have a good understanding of what a mutation in KRAS or a mutation in oncogenes like TI3 kinase do, we have less understanding of what amplifications in KRAS right. or what amplifications in PI3 kinase do. Right. And that's probably, we, we'd suggest that that's important cancer biology to uh, tease apart. I see. I see.
So I want to tell you about something that I've been doing, which is this on the opposite end of the spectrum, but maybe you'll have some thoughts that are unique because I rarely get to talk to somebody of your sort of thinking on this issue. But I guess I'm, I, I, I guess, uh, you know, one of the things I'm interested in is, of course, in, uh, in sort of fr- the patient side going backwards towards your end. So one of the things I'm interested in is in hype. And so we have so much in cancer medicine. Every drug I hear is a miracle. Then I go to clinic, I give it for a couple of years and I'm like, damn them, they lied to me. This ain't no miracle drug. This is a, a drug with some serious toxicities and it's much harder to take. And the duration of response is not nearly as good as those studies. So I get angry. Um, and I get angry on behalf of my patients. Um, but one of the things I noticed was that there's a lot of interest in um, in genomically targeted drugs, i.e. you test for a mutation. If you have the mutation, you give a drug that we think hits that mutation. ALK, rearrangements, EGFR, exon 19, a- um, activating mutations. Uh, and, and it was all sort of launched by imatinib. And and people talk about these things like they're they're terrific. And for those populations, I think... There's one thing that's terrific. Often there's a terrific shrinking of the tumor. The response looks terrific. And in the mind of a doctor, that has a huge psychological importance. People may suddenly feel better or suddenly gain weight, things like that. The durability was always not as terrific as some of the early, as imatinib. The durability would often, you know, wear off in 13 months, 18 months, which I know in cancer, sometimes that sounds good, but you can't forget that this is like a 45 year old person I'm talking to. So 18 months, two years, even five years. You know, it's not, we need more for a 45 year old, you know, they're, they're still going to pass away with many years of life lost. So anyway, I had noticed that the durability varied. So we did this study where we looked at all FDA approved genome targeted drugs. Those are where the, the doctor would have to test for a mutation. If they found the mutation, give the drug. And we just tried to calculate using sort of all the publicly available data, what percent of U.S. cancer patients were eligible for these drugs. And the answer was, it was a quite low fraction. It was something like 9% in 2018. We haven't published yet, but we've updated it to 2020. And it's, it's you know, maybe 10, 10.5%. And I went, took it all the way back to like 2004. Um, and it was about, you know, I forget, 4%. But the long story short is, it looks like it's going up at about 1% per year. Like every year, we'll learn that there is a targetable genomic alteration for which we have a new drug in about 1% more people. And, and, and tropomycin receptor kinase, TREC falls on this curve and RET falls on the curve. Um, so that's one thing I noticed that it was about 1% per year. Then I also noticed that we have a whole lot new drugs. So in another study, we were looking at, you know, how many new drugs do we have? And the answer is for every new target we figure out, we get about like two new drugs. So we like doubling our drugs. So drugs are more growing faster than the targets. Um, And then the last thing I looked at was the rate with which these targets are found in common cancers versus rare cancers. And this work is, you know, highly immature and I don't want to overstate it. But if you look at basket studies where they they take anyone with a HER2 mutation or anyone with a, um, a BRAF mutation and you look at the tumor types included and you plot like the percent of people in the basket study and the incidence of the tumor type, there is a statistically significant bias towards less frequent histologies, less frequent cancers. So I guess putting this all together, one of my hypotheses is that um, we may continue to find new genomic druggable targets, but I I don't see any evidence we're going to be finding them to to really bend the curve for 80% of cancer patients. I think the available evidence looks like we're just going to keep finding about 1% per year. Um, and then the other thing is, I think we're going to be preferentially finding them in histologies that are unusual. Like TREK is um, very common in salivary gland cancer and in infantile dermatofi- dermatofibroma and soft tissue sarcoma, which don't exactly fill my clinic. But tumors like prostate, lung, colon, breast, ovarian, especially in older people, like when you do the sequencing, their genomes look like a dinner plate that fell on the floor. It's just shattered. I mean, just broken everywhere. And yeah, sometimes there's a BRAF mutation in like one in a hundred people, but it may not be a driver. It may just be, you know, the, the sequela of a genome that can't get its act together and is screwing up everything. Uh, the same thing with, I guess, some of these um, chromosomal duplications. It might just be the genome is so screwed, it breaking everything. It can't even hold itself together. So I guess, I don't know, any of anything that I'm saying kind of make make you think yeah. of anything biology? Yeah. Yeah, a- absolutely. I think that this uh, issue really speaks to what I think is a fundamental disconnect between basic research in cancer and translational research and patient therapies. And I think that some of the, the problems that you've spoken about really get to the heart of um, some of the challenges in basic research in identifying and advancing good drugs and good targets. So for instance, um, you spoke about this issue, you give patients a particular therapy, 
you get a strong response, an initial response, but then you inevitably see some relapse. Yeah. Um, so you think for a second, probably every drug uh, that you're giving in the clinic probably was tested and works in mouse models. Yeah. Uh, you give it to a mouse, works great in a mouse. Now think about the volumes involved in a mouse or in a mouse tumor versus in a human. So in a mouse xenograft study, which I think probably all of these drugs were tested in and did very well, maybe you're injecting 10 to the six cells into a mouse, uh, you're letting them grow, you're treating them when they're 10 to the seventh, 10 to the eighth cells, you give them some drug, and let's say that that drug eliminates 99.999% of cancer cells. Yes. The mouse is cured. Yes. You have cured the mouse of cancer. Yes. But just in terms of volume. Yes. Now you think about a, a tumor in a human. And, you know, that, that tumor maybe has 10 to the 9th cells, you I know, see. 10 yeah. to the 10th cells. Yeah. It's kilograms. Um, and then if a yeah. drug is 99.999% effective, you've left a million cells yes. behind yes. to relapse and metastasize. Yes. And so um, it's just th this problem of drug resistance and relapse is very hard to study in a tiny yes. organism like a mouse. So I think that that's one uh, mm. huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and studying things like like relapse and resistance are, are hard in basic biology in a petri dish or in a mouse. I think that the, the second problem or the, the second related issue is, well, maybe one solution to that or one way to mop up those remaining cells is with immunotherapy, mm -hmm. is with some mechanism of unleashing uh, the host's immune system to target and destroy cancer cells. Well, the most cancer research is done in a Petri dish, definite caveat to the research that I've told you about, and you cannot, you know, recapitulate a full immune system in a Petri dish and then on top of that, uh, for the most part, mouse experiments yeah. are done in immunocompromised mice. nude mice, yeah. which lack an adaptive immune system. Uh, and again, so you can't study uh, immunology or immune checkpoint inhibitors effectively in the standard models that are used in basic cancer research. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and say, we do it so much better, or I know what the solution is. I, I just want to point out that I think these are, are common problems in, in preclinical research, and it's really important for us as a field to try to address them head on and figure it out so that we can identify what will be the most effective drugs in the clinic so we don't get this problem of, you know, the the three week, you know, the yeah. three week response or the three month increase in survival and that we can actually get good durable cures. Yeah, that's that's well put. I mean, and it makes me think of a couple of things. Um, one is the adjuvant metastatic dilemma, which is, of course, um, a drug. And we've done some empirical work on this, which we published recently. But basically, it looks like roughly one in three drugs that work in the metastatic setting work in the adjuvant setting. By that, I mean the metastatic setting. The horse has left the barn. The tumor's in multiple sites. When you put a person in a scanner, you'll see tumor in the lung and in the liver and in the breast where it came from. In the adjuvant setting, the tumor is localized in the target organ. We've surgically extirpated it. We got it all cut out. And if you put the person in every scanner on earth, you won't be able to see the, the tumor. But you do know, sometimes in a sizable fraction like lung cancer, maybe as high as 60, 70, 80% in some high-stage lung cancer, you know that even though I don't see anything, there's some microscopic disease out there. So the drugs in the metastatic setting, the, the only thing they need to do to eke out a survival advantage is to kill like some 99% of the tumor, shrink it down a lot, and then, you know, based on like the amount of, you know, you're only going to live like three months and now you live six months or five months, you know, that, I guess that two-month average, because we've killed a little bit of the tumor and we bought you a little bit of time, maybe one or two cell divisions. I don't know. You, you'll tell me the answer to there. Like how many, we bought you a couple cell divisions and so, you know, we say, extended your life a few months. But in the adjuvant setting, to give a drug that's effective – it can't just kill a lot of the tumor. It's got to really go from a few cells left, maybe uh, something less than a million, but I mean something less than that, to, z to like almost no cells. You have to like really eliminate the last microscopic cell. And for a drug to do that, and have tolerability that you can administer to a lot of people, many of whom may already be cured. I mean, it really has to be a really good drug, like only hit the problem and not hit anything normal. Um, do you think about that challenge, this adjuvant metastatic challenge? 
So I can't say that uh, we think about that challenge uh, particularly. Yeah. Studying metastasis, studying residual disease in a mouse is quite difficult. Um, but your comment about you know preventing one or two cell divisions did make me think about another uh, gap, I think, yes. between basic Go. research yeah. and, uh, and actual medicine, um, which is... So many drugs are mitotic inhibitors yes. or are cell cycle inhibitors. Um, and they work great in cancer cell lines and they work great in xenografts, but in human patients. Uh, so there are a lot of cell cycle inhibitors that entered clinical trials and just failed. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And then some other, you know, DNA damaging, DNA targeting agents have very, very high toxicity. Um, and so, yes, they may buy an extra cell cycle or two, uh, but overall, that that isn't enough for a durable cure. Yes. And I think, again, that that results from this gap between basic research and medicine. And that is the cancer cell lines that we're studying. We work with cancer cell lines in my lab that have a doubling time of 16 or 18 hours. Hmm. Um, Brisk. And, you know, right, that, which is an extremely, extremely fast doubling <laughs> yeah. time. And you can correct me, but I think I've read in the literature that for actual uh, tumors in human patients, if tumor volume doubles <laughs> every 100 days, yeah. it would be considered a very aggressive sure, very tumor. very aggressive, yeah. And so we are, in some cases, designing drugs to target uh, the cell cycle or drugs to target to cause DNA damage or cells to target these things, which are very important for a cell that's dividing every 16 hours, but actually that might be not be the most, you know, important facet for eliminating a tumor in a person. And in actual people, your gut cells and your blood cells might actually be more mitotically active than a prostate tumor or a colon tumor. Yes. So again, I see this disconnect and I, I'm not sitting here and saying, I know what to do about it because I do not. Um, but it can lead to some of those problems that you're talking about where drugs just have high toxicity and limited efficacy because they're coming from yes. a setup that a isn't very a artificial. perfect recapitulation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I see a lot, I mean, it's kind of related, but maybe a little tangential to what we've been talking about, but one of the things I see a lot is um, um, people confusing prognosis for th um, a therapy. So for instance, if I give a drug to 100 people, some people have no detectable tumor, complete response. Some people have partially shrunk tumor and some people don't have much tumor. Obviously, the people who have a complete response are going to do better than the people who just have a, a mild shrinkage of the tumor. Um, uh, so then the logic is that if you take somebody with a partial response and you give them way more drugs to drive them down to the complete response, that they're going to have as good an outcome as the person who got to there, who got to the complete response even with just the first drug and this is a strategy that's used in i guess the new talk is multiple myeloma we have a lot of drugs that get good response rate but now we have some drugs that get them to minimal residual disease so just you know less than 20 cells per 1 million on flow cytometry of myeloma are left behind but the problem is the horizons we're talking about are seven years and so if you get somebody from i don't know a uh, thousand cells per million to 20 per million on the order of seven years from now, you know, I'm not sure how much time that's going to buy you like to achieve a little bit higher minimal residual disease. Um, and I think the other fallacy is, is that the people whose tumors initially got to 20 per million or less than 20 per million, their, their tumor was more likely to die. It was more susceptible. The biology was more susceptible. The person whose tumor only shrunk a little bit, it's not that if you did more stuff to shrink it, they'll have a better outcome. The problem is that biology is stubborn. It's going to grow back no matter what. It's got more problems in it. Um, I wonder if, if this is something that you, you think about. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, the combination strategy seems promising yeah. so long as toxicity can be taken care of. I, I think it, it's how at least for a brief period of time in humanity's history, yeah, we, we turned bacterial diseases, uh -huh. right? We, we were able to cure bacteria using combination therapies that hit bacteria in, uh, yes. in multiple uh, independent disease. mechanisms. Yes. Yeah. Um, and now maybe we have drug resistant bacteria. And so maybe <laughs> we'll look back on the seventies and eighties as this, this, you know, high point in our, in our fight. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that's a strategy that has been successfully applied in a different setting. Um, and if we can capture 
multiple independent escape mechanisms and multiple independent resistance mechanisms of a particular tumor, so long as the toxicity is under control, you know, and, and the, the treatments are worth it, it at least seems promising to me, you know, but I guess you'll have to be the one who tells me how it actually turns out uh, when it's used in the clinic. I see. Um, does your paper in your, your paper that just came out in Nature Review Genetic about genetic dependence, that covers some of the things we've already talked about? Yes. Okay. Okay. And then the last. Ah, I, sorry. I actually have, have two related papers. I, I thought oh. you were asking about the uh, the ACE two paper. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was uh, uh, a co author, not senior author, on a paper about Camostat two, but it's actually related to uh, this cancer drug targeting problem. Okay. Um, and so, so I, I'm happy to tell me that talk about that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but I want to uh, be clear that the majority of work was done by Stefan Pullman, uh, and my lab contributed uh, some uh, additional, uh, smaller uh, work to that manuscript. Okay, you've done work in TMP, TMPR SS2? <laughs> um, the work that we did, uh, it was it was largely done uh, by Stefan Pullman's group, and we uh, contributed uh, some research to it. So the idea is that for SARS-CoV-2 to enter cells, uh, it binds to ACE2, which is a protein that's present on the surface of lung cells. And then once it binds to ACE2, uh, it has to undergo proteolytic processing uh, by a serine protease, and it was widely believed that Tempris 2 was essential for this processing. However, uh, it hadn't actually been demonstrated whether Tempris 2 was necessary or whether Tempris 2 is sufficient. And when you actually look at Tempris 2's homologs, it turns out that other Tempris family proteins, like Tempris 11 and yes. Tempris 13, yes. are actually able to substitute for Tempris 2. I see. So <laughs> I Tempris see. 2, sufficient but not necessary. Yes. Then there's Camostat 2. Camostat 2 was developed as a Tempris 2 inhibitor, and it's in clinical trials for COVID-19. Yes. It turns out that when you do genetic experiments using cells that overexpress Tempris 11 or Tempris 13 instead, Camostat remains perfectly effective. <laughs> so even though this drug was developed I as see. a Tempris, Tempris 2, 2 inhibitor. inhibitor, it actually has off-target activity against other uh, homologs of this enzyme. I see. And so I think just like precision therapies in cancer sometimes fall short, I think there's this disconnect between you know, biochemical experiments and actual genetic evidence uh, is important for understanding uh, SARS-CoV-2 and coronavirus treatments as well. I see. That is that is fascinating. I see. So I guess if you were a betting man, you wouldn't bet too much on on this uh, this. And by the way, I didn't know it was pronounced Tempris. That's much better than what I was saying. TMPS. I kept saying it over and over again last podcast. Uh, you 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 would not be betting a lot on this new drug. I know nothing about its toxicity profile. Um, I, 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 I just want to say that I don't know. I see. I, I see. Just, uh, you hear that, investors? Jason numbers. says not. To, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jason says not. <laughs> nobody. He says nobody. No. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. No, that's fair. That's very interesting. But it's the exact same mm -hmm. problem that we see in cancer yeah. medicine. Yeah. It's a. Mm -hmm. It's a great analogy. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, I mean, this was a really useful tour about, I think, some of the fundamental challenges in cancer medicine, and we can maybe revisit at the end. But the last thing I wanted you to talk about is something that you have also studied. Um, and I really love when your Twitter threads talk about this, because, you know, some of this stuff is, is I guess, I don't know, some of this stuff is like shop talk kind of stuff, but it's, it's about the workforce and scientific workforce and hiring and those sorts of things. Um, you know, I think you had a nice one recently where you, um, you used publicly available um, evidence, uh, publicly available um, announcements for graduate seminars to sniff out a little bit of who are the people who are in the job candidate sphere and what have they published. And by job candidate, I mean like for their first assistant professorship job in the life sciences and, and what have they published? And, uh, you know, it was it blew me away. You know, these are people who are just so many papers in, in the, in the big three cell, nature, science, cell, nature, science. 
Um, my dear friend from uh, undergrad, he's a postdoc right now at, at Harvard in, in uh, and his background's in systems biology. And, uh, you know, I think he's got two first author nature and one co-first author science paper. And I think maybe a cell too. Four, four nature cell science papers. And he had a hell of a time in the job market. Oh, maybe he won't like me saying this. Um, but he had a hell of a time. I mean, I think he applied to like 80 institutions and got like, I don't know, eight interviews and and um, and just a handful of offers. And it was it was sobering because we graduated uh, college a long time ago and I've been working for a few years and he's been slaving away in laboratories all this time. And, and so, uh, you know, for I, at least 18 years of, of, of training after, after high school um, to become an a, a independent PI, which he finally is going to be. Um, so I wonder if you might walk us through, I mean, first, I think the broad field, and then we can talk about the, the disparities work you've looked at. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that uh, the academic job market is incredibly important and also incredibly opaque. Yes. Uh, there are really no published guidelines out there on what, you know, any particular university is looking to hire. There are no large scale studies on who gets hired, who get doesn't, who doesn't. And when you have processes that have so little transparency as this, I think that it introduces the possibility that biases might be entering the system. Yes. Um, that maybe the old boys network is coming into play, that people might be hiring from their friend's lab, uh, basically that, that you might be kind of undermining the meritocracy because there, there's no transparency and no oversight. And so I've been interested in using publicly available data to try to get insight on what it is that assistant professors are bringing to the table and what assistant professors need in order to get hired by uh, academic institutions. Yeah. And when you look at the CVs of assistant professors at top-ranked institutions like UCSF and Rockefeller and places like that, uh, it turns out that about 70% or more of them published a first author paper in one of three journals, Cell, Nature, or Science, mm. uh, during their academic career before they went on the job market. Um, and it just seems like that- And, and uh, you're saying any authorship or first authorship? First authorship. Oh my first God. Authorship. I mean, that's that's really a remarkable, I mean, I mean, how many pa yeah, it's just so remarkable. Anyway, go on, finish your thought, then I'll go uh, crazy yeah, about it. And, and so, it seems like in many cases, these universities may be selecting for uh, authorship in this paper, uh, in these journals, but at the same time, authorship in these journals undoubtedly sell nature and science, publish groundbreaking work. Some of the most important discoveries of all time have been published in those journals, but they're also tending to publish particular kinds of science. Yes. Flashy science. Yes. Large scale science. Yes. Um, and in some cases, uh, issues have arisen regarding the reproducibility of research published in those journals. Yes. And I think it speaks to the potential that some of these institutions may be exhibiting, uh, may be preferring flashy, high profile science uh, as opposed to steady, reproducible, less flashy science. Yes. That is interesting. I mean, I guess the reproducibility thing and the work you've done kind of intertwine. I mean, I remember maybe it was about a decade ago, I first started hearing about some of the internal workings of companies. So I think it was Glenn Begley and Lee Ellis, I think writing in Nature. The Amgen. The paper. Amgen. Yeah, yeah, right. That was Amgen was the first. And so so Glenn Begley, of course, I think he was a vice president at Amgen and he was leading some of the basic lab. And one of the first things they did was they, I think they were doing exactly what you were doing. They're trying to figure out these basic science papers says this is a good target. And Amgen says, should we invest money in this? And so what they said was, let's, let's just try to recreate this paper. And then the first thing they did was they, did it exactly like the author said, and they never got, they didn't get the same result, and I forget, something like two-thirds. Um, and then they they called the author up, entered into confidentiality agreements, paid the author money, flew them out to Thousand Oaks, said, get this thing to work, and they couldn't do it in, in a sizable percentage of the time. Uh, since then, we had the bear. So, the, sorry, yeah, no, go on, go on. I, I just, I, I can't, I, I cannot let that study go unchallenged. Okay, okay. Uh, the Amgen study itself is 100% irreproducible. Shut up. They have refused every they don't invitation tell you. or request yes, for data. to yeah. disclose what studies it was 
they tried to replicate okay. and how they replicated them. So yes, it, it could be true. It may not be true, but their study itself claiming irreproducibility <laughs> is irreproducible. And so this is a I'm pet familiar. peeve of yours I've stumbled onto. It is. It is. It okay. Is, it is. If you're going to make a provocative yes. claim, I yes. think that you have to back it up with data I like and you. let yourself be open to, to challenge. Okay. I like that. Okay. That's fair. So then I think, th I mean, to answer that question, though, there is some ongoing effort I heard to replicate. Um, what was it? It was like 50 papers in, 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 in CNS. Uh, yeah. Um, by led by Nozick and such. Yeah. What's this? Yeah. So there is a, a cancer reproducibility yes. project, yes. which uh, initially set out to replicate 50 high profile studies uh, published between 2010 and 2012 or something like that. Unfortunately, um, that that program kind of ran out of money. Yes. Uh, and the last time that I checked, I believe they had cut. They they were no longer trying to replicate fifty. They were down to seventeen. Or oh, something that's a that shame. They were trying to replicate, which is unfortunate. But I I highly support their goal. I think that kind of reproducibility work is extremely important, um, and not easy to do. Yes. I see. And then I guess I should say that I do agree with you that this is annoying to me that, um, I mean, the, the issue that I always come to is like the cost to develop a drug and then the popular Tufts estimate. You, they don't tell you what companies, they don't tell you what drugs and they don't tell you anything and you're supposed to trust them. And then we did our own estimate and it wasn't anything like that at all. But I guess to answer to the question not coming back here is, mm -hmm. I mean, is there an answer to the question? Like what percent of, 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 of these science, of these things would replicate or do we just not know yet? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. Um, I don't know. Okay. And let me give you, I think there's there's another side of the coin. Okay. So so we we've talked in this podcast a lot about um, my own lab's inability to replicate certain findings uh, and about how some of the, the research that we're doing is maybe challenging what certain other people believe. Uh, there's another side to this coin, and it was described by uh, Peter Walter, uh, who's a uh, very uh, brilliant scientist, uh, worked out how endoplasmic reticulum trafficking and the unfolded protein response work. Uh, he was president of the American Society for Cell Biology, and he published this story about him trying to build a clock as a wedding gift for his daughter's wedding. <laughs> okay. And so he said he read a book yeah. on clock making. Yeah. He watched YouTube videos about how to make a clock. He followed every step yes. in the, the clockmaker's manual. Yes. Um, and you know, he's, a, he's a brilliant scientist, good with his hands, and he put it all together. And then when he turned it on, it didn't tick. <laughs> it did not work. Okay. He was as careful as possible, and the <laughs> clock did not work. Yeah. And so he said, you know, maybe from this, you could falsely believe that clocks are made up, that I clocks see. are irreproducible. I see. I see. But that actually isn't it. Um, it could be the difference in the wood. It could be the difference in the temperature that I built it. And then it, it changed shape when the temperature changed shape. And then he went back, he took everything apart. He did everything more carefully the second time. And then the second time he built the clock, the clock worked. Okay. So just because, so a, a human cell is a million times more complicated yes. than a wooden clock. Yes. Is. And so just because something is hard to reproduce or, or hard to produce on the first time, uh, perhaps jumping to the conclusion that it's irreproducible might not be, that, that might not be a, a legitimate logical inference. Biology is hard. Maybe Amgen tried to do these studies. Maybe they used the wrong antibody. Maybe yes, they used the wrong sure. cell lines. Maybe their cells were contaminated with mycoplasma. Like reproducibility in itself is an extremely complicated endeavor. Um, and just because something fails or gives a different result the first time, just like trying to build a clock, doesn't mean that the whole enterprise is wrong. I, That's I mean, kind of the, the, the flip side of what we've been talking about, which I think is important to keep in mind. Yes. And, and, and that's good to talk about. I mean, the flip side as well. I guess I would say... Um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that one of the things you have to ask yourself when you can't re reproduce something is, did you f it up yourself? Um, but um, I guess it, it's interesting to me because I guess there's there's reproducibility in a couple of ways. One, experimental reproducibility, but reproducibility of the inference. And that's what I'm like most interested yeah. in is like, is there take home message something you can hang your hat on? And I guess in, in your study, you were reproducing the inference, um, not necessarily exactly what they did. You want to know, does this drug work through this target? 
ergo no. So the yeah, so you're nodding. I, I fully agree. Okay. I, I think that the, the response to the clock analogy is for cancer biology, if our goal in cancer biology is to find something that's going to be robust enough yes. that you can actually give it in a real world yes. setting to yes. human patients. It has to be. If if it only works when the moon is full and the tides are high <laughs> yeah. and it's 72 degrees in the room and no one, you know, looks askew at the at the plate of cells, then that's not the most robust result. And maybe it doesn't have as good a chance of, of working in a real world setting. If something's going to work in a real world setting, you want it to be robust that yeah. it's hard to mess up. Yeah, that's well put. Okay, now back to what I wanted to talk to you about, about the work mm-hmm. thing. So, so the first yeah. thing you found was uh-huh. these people are... Um, they got they got a lot of papers in the top journals, which is a certain type mm-hmm. of science. And I guess if mm-hmm. you were thinking two steps down the road, I want to be a professor someday. Not only do you have to think I got to get one of these papers, you think like I have to study one of the fields that is ripe for getting these papers. So like there's some people doing maybe really good science in sort of esoteric niche fields that they are not going to even be able to get to nature cell science because it's kind of a side. It's like a, it's considered a side hobby or side field. Yeah. And I think additionally, one of the things that we found is that there is a significant um, hierarchy in the hiring process. Uh, That is, if you look at the labs where assistant professors did their training, where assistant professors were previously postdoctoral researchers, uh, they have a few things in common. Uh, One of which is that a lot of assistant professors previously trained in a member of the National Academy of Sciences Mm -hmm. lab, uh, which is a prestigious organization uh, for um, very accomplished scientists. Mm -hmm. So uh, postdocs who are training, who are themselves training with junior faculty Mm -hmm. are underrepresented among assistant professors Mm -hmm. in the next generation of faculty. Yes. On top of that, there are certain institutions where... uh, assistant professors tend to come from yes uh institutions like harvard rockefeller sloan kettering ucsf yes uh the the most prestigious biomedical research institutions perhaps unsurprisingly tend to produce the most new assistant professors yes and so there are these hierarchies and i I, you know i I don't want to sit here and say they're wrong there are of course uh, you know undoubtedly absolutely top-notch scientists at all sorts of institutions Um, I just wanted to kind of describe these patterns to make them apparent and and make it easier for people to figure out, you know, their career paths. That's and and that's a useful thing that we just don't talk enough about. Um, One of the things that it makes me think about, and I'm going to ask you also about your paper um, where you talk about in PNAS, elite male faculty in life sciences employ fewer women. And 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 the reason I mentioned that is because, I mean, many outside observers have, I think, rightly pointed out that there are um, persistent issues of diversity, both for women, the, 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 the headwinds that they face, as well as underrepresented minorities. And, and then the one that's kind of really hard to talk about because it's not as apparent in data is just the number of people who are faculty who are kids of poor people. Um, and that's really hard in medicine because um, you know, we can, we, we have, I mean, to some degree we've, we've worked on the women problem. Thank God. You know, we, I think we have more women matriculants than men in this country. Um, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done on the underrepresented minority, um, imbalance in medicine. There's still a lot of work to be done on the women in positions of power problem. That's another problem, but at least we're, you know, getting more women doctors. Um, uh, but the, and the one thing that I think it's been difficult to talk about and tackle is like how many medical students are there whose parents are in the bottom quartile of income or wealth. And the answer is super, super few and far between. And if there were, I, th- I don't know this to be true, but I, I suspect it was, I, th- I think actually think it might be true that the single biggest predictor of being a, a medical school um, uh, matriculant is having a parent who's a doctor is <laughs> like, you know, like the single best key in the lock. They know, they tell you how to write your essay and how to, how to get in just for fine. Um, but anyway, the one thing I wanted to ask you about is um, one of the observations I've made, I've not been able to prove is that, uh, but from talking to people, is that in my med school, there were a few of us who, um, you know, we came from households that were probably in the bottom, you know, 50% of income. Um, and, And those people I found have a lot of pressure in a hard to sort of articulate sense on finishing training quickly, um, not staying for extra training, like an extra research year or whatever. I think they're much more likely to go to private practice because the pay is higher and the jobs are quicker. 
And, and I think that's, that exists to some degree in the PhD world too, where I know some people graduate with PhDs and, you know, they don't come from a lot of money and they have a couple offers. They could either be postdoc for God knows how many years to get a faculty job, or they can go to work for Pfizer and make six figures right now, maybe kick a few bucks to their parents or something like that, or a family member who needs it. So I wonder if you might talk about like a little bit how you think about those sorts of issues of, you know, it, it is to some degree a luxury to be able to spend, you know, 25 years trying to get your first job um, at, at relatively low pay as a postdoc. Yeah, I think uh, those are extremely important questions, also e extremely difficult to get data on. Yeah. So we looked at this a little bit through the gender lens. Uh, you mentioned our, our PNAS study to kind of put it in a nutshell by looking at lab directories and uh, research groups websites. We counted up the men and women in different labs, and we found that there were huge differences in who tended to hire women as grad students and postdocs. Uh, Nobel laureates ran labs that were about 75% men, 25% women, even though overall uh, about 40 to 50% of researchers in the life sciences are women. Hmm. So Nobel laureates were hiring very few female postdocs and grad students into their labs. Mm -hmm. I think that influences, you know, if someone's doing their, their PhD with a Nobel laureate that opens up certain doors for later in their career. Sure. And our data suggests that that might be uh, more accessible to men than to women. Hmm. Now, I would be very, very interested in doing that same sort of analysis for um, race and ethnicity yeah. or for uh, parental income. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that often isn't uh, reported on people's CVs. Yeah. Uh, it's not on Google Scholar. And so I, I can't access that data just through a web search data mining approach. Um, yes. But I fully agree with you that things like that could be profoundly shaping who has access to what sort of resources. And it just isn't something that, that I know how to study right now. Uh, but if any listeners have ideas here, want to collaborate with me, uh, feel free to reach out with, to me. This is really an, an ongoing interest of mine, how these differences in uh, resource allocation and opportunity influence the academic pipeline. Yes. And we're, we'll put... Um... Kiana will put your um your email address in our in our mailing so people will be able to get in touch with you. But I think it's it's super interesting to me as well. I mean, I do think it's an important issue. It needs to be tackled. We need to have a uh, you know have a professorship that looks as diverse as this country looks. Yeah. Um, and and that's a key. And I think that we need to also disentangle the the sorts of things, implicit bias, which I'm sure exists. That's part of it. Um, Differences in people's career choices based on um, what they what they can afford to do, um, what they what they can do in terms of timing of their lives, how many years they can spend as a trainee. I mean, I kind of want to know about that too. Maybe there are other things we can do to empower people that are kind of hard to envision, um, like paid daycare for so um, so people yeah. women in their thirties who might want to have kids could have kids, or maybe even like extra stipends for people who are coming from poor families, like so that it could actually be more equitable. I mean, you know, um, how can I put it? Financial so aid I, is need dependent, but maybe postdoc stipend should be need dependent. My, my friend was a postdoc. He told me what he made and where he lived. And I was like, my God, you would die living on that. I mean, you can't <laughs> live there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fully agree. And I think um, in the current setup, a lot of the onus falls on the postdocs and the students. Yes. Uh, figure out a way to live on a $35,000 right. a year stipend. Right. You know, okay, you're going to be a postdoc for eight years, and then you're going to get that faculty position. Yes. Um, you know, you the, the, the burden is on you to overcome these problems and challenges. And I would suggest that I think maybe we need to change our thinking a little and say, you know, uh, these are institutions that are supported with billions of dollars in NIH and government funding. Uh, the departments are run by Nobel laureates, yes. and National Academy members yes. who have received millions of dollars in government funding. And I think that the onus for this diversification should fall on the institutions and the senior faculty and not on you know, maybe the, the medical student with $200,000 worth of debt or the postdoc who's trying to survive 
in their seventh year as a postdoc with a salary of $35,000. Yeah. The, the onus should be on the institution. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Thirty five. Yeah, they're surviving on $35,000. And since they've been there seven years and another 10 years of PhD, they have two kids who are in elementary school. And they're like, like my yeah. goodness, how are they going to do it? Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is an issue that I've written about. Um, and I'll tell you what I said about it. So, you know, you don't, you don't hate me. Um, but, um, the Nobel Prize and other big science prizes, and I really have a lot. And I know you've 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 been a, a good because you also m- kind of toss out predictions in advance of the prize, um, and 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 there are ways you can predict. Um, I guess um, we'll talk about that. But I guess what, my thoughts about the Nobel Prize are: I mean, of course, we, you know, we want to show kids out there that science is cool and awesome. You know, that's why after you know Kennedy put people on the moon. A lot of kids went into science. It's it's um, you know science is an amazing thing, and it's definitely something one of the most perfect things you could pursue with your life. And and things like prizes maybe do kind of get science out there and they let people know about science and they're really great promotions for science. So I do like that. Some of my problems with some of these big prizes is, you know, we give every prize to the same person. I mean, <laughs> one person does one thing and they get a prize like three million dollars, but they have to get every prize. They got to get the they got to get the um, the Japan prize, and they got to get the Meyerberg, and they got to get the the Lasker, and then they got to get the Nobel, and then they got to get the Breakthrough Prize, and they, they get all the prizes. The few people getting all the prizes for the discovery, fine. CRISPR is going to get all the prizes eventually. It's already gotten a couple, but it will get them all. Um, and Jim Allison, he's working his way through getting all the prizes. I think he's gotten most of them now. He'll get the last one soon. Um, okay, I don't know. I mean, that to me is also reminiscent of the way we fund labs. A couple labs they got five R ones and then the rest of us are like we're scrounging for pennies to do something over here i like to joke that um you know a lot of the nobel prize winning discoveries they occurred in labs on a shoestring budget and then the moment they have like an unlimited budget they never have any more nobel prize winning discoveries because the truth about science is it's a lot of serendipity and a lot of being there young often at the right place at the right time uh, to be working on something um, where few people are working on it that ended up being really transformational so I guess, I don't know, you think a lot about the prizes as well. I mean, I guess I see the benefits are getting the science out there. The downsides are we always pick the same people. It's another way we kind of consolidate power in the hands of fewer people. Um, they're not diverse. Um, and some of these discoveries, you know, like, do I think Jim Allison is a smart guy? Of course he is. I mean, I've talked, he's a smart guy and he was courageous because he did something when people said, you know, you, you're a fool for doing that is what people told him and he's still stuck with it. So I give him a lot of credit, but there's other people out there, Jim Allison prime, just as smart, just as, you know, willing to push in a new direction, but didn't get that lucky break at the end. It didn't pan out. But we don't think about the Jim Allison's primes of the world. Um, although there was that one guy who won the Nobel Prize a couple years ago. What was his name? He lived in Maine and he had retired. And um, oh my goodness, um, he was he was I think he was a uh, chemistry. Doug Prasher? Are you talking about Doug Prasher? No, it was this guy who had retired and he was like living and he was like just drinking on his porch and then he was like they told him he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, I'm gonna I think his name is Hall. Um, let me pull him up. Michael Hall? No, no. Who was okay. it? All right, I'll, I'll I'll we'll pause. What are your thoughts on the Nobel Prize? So I think I'm going to offer an opinion, uh, which is certainly controversial on science Twitter. Oh, good. uh, Not too many people agree with me. Okay. Uh, And the the opinion is that I like the Nobel Prize. Oh. Um, I think. uh, (laughs) Go on, go on. on. It's still very controversial as evidenced by your reaction. Okay. So I think, okay. (laughs) Think about in the past 12 months. Yes. Um, when has science been on the front page of the New York Times? In a positive um, way we, or negative way? <laughs> right, right. We have had a debate about chloroquine's efficacy, yeah. you know, uh, phase one study of four patients, you know, injected yeah. with a, a coronavirus vaccine. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, sometimes cases of scientific fraud. Yes, right? yes, that's yes. That's oftentimes how <laughs> science gets into. So that's one way science gets into the news. Another way is with overhyped BS, basically. <laughs> yes, you know, we, we've yes. seen that with coronavirus, yes. but also with cancer, you know. Yes. New drug breakthrough for cancer care. Yes. Uh, d- doesn't turn out to be anything in, in many cases. The Nobel Prize is an instance, I think, where good solid, groundbreaking science gets celebrated for a week, where the discovery of uh, protein trafficking or telomeres or the TOR signaling pathway or the HIP pathway gets written about in an article on the front page of the New York Times and gets covered on the nightly news. 
And there are these good, solid articles, you know, not about how, oh, all of a sudden cancer is cured, but this is what the inside of our cells look like. This is this process. We didn't know how cells sense oxygen. And then Kaylin and colleagues discovered the HIF pathway, and that tells us how cells respond to hypoxic conditions. Yes. And I just, I, I think science is something that should be celebrated yes. around the world. I think that science is a source of immense good, potential good for, for mankind. And I like instances in which it's celebrated. Yes. And so that said, um, that, that doesn't negate all of the problems that you mentioned. It is, uh, should be awarded to more diverse cohorts. Uh, the the problem that you identified, the Matthew effect, yes. the rich get rich richer, get richer yeah. right? The, the Someone gets uh, the Lasker Prize, then they're much more likely to get the Nobel Prize yes. as well. When really, I think your career is doing quite okay <laughs> yeah, if you right. won the Lasker. <laughs> yeah, I think that those are all issues, but I am happy for a day or a week when science is celebrated. Uh, in previous administrations, seeing, you know, the Nobel Prize winners going to the White House and yeah. shaking hands with Obama, yeah. yes. you know, that that's, that's, uh, I, I like seeing science put on that pedestal, and the Nobel Prize has that effect. That's fair. I, I, I and I, I like that part of it, too. I like that part of it, too. And the person I was thinking of was Jeffrey Hall, um, who was oh. retired, and he was like caught in Maine drinking. And he was like, Oh, thanks. You know, this will keep me going longer. Um, but I loved his attitude talking about the, the headaches. Um, I guess the only thing I would add is there's another I mean, I guess I would say like, what's another example of a prize that I think does a great job? I would say um, the MacArthur Genius Award. Um, it almost never goes to a scientist. <laughs> it's always like some poet or dancer. Um, you know, people doing really talented things. But I mean, what do I? I don't know anything about that stuff. And I don't know. Sometimes I look at art and I think, you know, that's just a, that's just some junk. But I mean, what? <laughs> I don't know. What do I know? So I, I have to shout out yeah. uh, Zachary Littman, who is a professor at Cold Spring Harbor, yeah. who recently won the MacArthur oh, Prize for his work. Yes, genetic engineering of plants, and he is an absolute brilliant scientist. And yes. So, so, um, so here's why I like the, the MacArthur uh -huh. philosophy, because mm -hmm. they're picking people typically earlier in their career where that kind of recognition does. I'm sure it'll change the trajectory of his life. I mean, maybe, yeah. you know, it'll get it'll keep him going. Um, the other thing I like it is I read about some of the, the scientists who win and it is it's I mean, it's just as inspirational as I think the scientists who win the Nobel Prize. Um, it's just that we we don't know exactly what will come of their work. Um, but your point is well taken. I mean, the, it is good for a change, especially now to get some some positive science, um, some science news out there. Yep. Well, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. This was terrific. We've talked for a long time. Um, I will reiterate that I think, you know, um, you're, you're a really important thinker in basic science of cancer and cancer medicine. Uh, we're lucky to have you. And I guess I would say that, um, you know, it, 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 there is a phenomenon where I read like three papers by one person and I'm like, oh shit, something's going on here. And I definitely felt that way when I read your papers a long time ago. I think it was even before I followed you on Twitter because, you know, these papers are on things that I find really interesting, which is sort of broadly thinking about this space. I think it's important to do exactly what you did, which was to talk about, you know, how um, reproducibility it, it can be done wrong, but it can also be done right. And I think you're doing a great job of kind of walking that walking that line and doing, I think, what the core of science is, which is to question the assumptions that underlie our view of cancer and to make sure we're really solid about all our assumptions, because presumably that will mean that the steps we take from those assumptions are stronger, more likely to be true, and more likely to lead to beneficial treatments. But I, I just want to give you the last word, anything that um, you know you want to talk about. Nope. Uh, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you, Vinay. So, Jason, thank you so much for coming on. And folks can check out um, you on Twitter. Um, they can email you if they're interested in doing this work on the scientific labor market, labor force, and how we hire. You want to toss out your email now in case they, they're listening? Yep. So you can reach me at my last name, S-H-E-L-T-Z-E-R, at C-S-H-L.edu. Or you can message me on Twitter. My handle is J-S-H-E-L-T-Z-E-R. Slide into his DM. So thanks, Jason. You've been listening to Season 3 of Plenary Session. Plenary Session is produced by Kiana Klossner. Music by Ian Straley and Audrey Tran. The views expressed on Plenary Session are those of whoever said it and no one else. Plenary Session is not medical advice. 
follow us on Twitter at plenary underscore session. Until next time.